Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome. It's nice to see everyone. It's nice to see people in person and uh, for, for a good day of uh, work and information. Um, my name is Jonathan Sachs, and I'm on the executive board of Safe and Just Michigan. I'm uh, really pleased to see everybody. Well, uh, welcome to an important uh, cross-section. I see legislators, judges, prosecutors, public defenders, defense attorneys, folks from the Michigan Department of Corrections, criminal legal system advocates and researchers, and justice-impacted people. That's exactly the sort of group we need to start a conversation and move towards resentencing of long and uh, severe prison sentences in Michigan. Um, a, a few folks in particular I saw, and thank you for attending, uh, Representative Sarah Leitner. Uh, I saw Judge uh, Elizabeth Gleischer from the Court of Appeals, Judge Chris Yates uh, from Kent County, um, Judge Timothy Kenny from, uh, from Wayne County, and I know we have other uh, members of uh, the bench and bar coming in later. Uh, thank you to the Department of Corrections folks who are here. I s saw um, Kyle Kaminsky and also Keith Barber from the Ombudsman's Office. And it's good to see public defenders, criminal defense attorneys, and prosecutors here as well. I'm an, on the executive board of Safe and Just Michigan, like I said, but in my day job, I'm director of the State Appellate Defender Office. We routinely correct sentencing errors there. In 2021, as a sample year, we counted 201 years of sentencing errors that were corrected for a whole series of uh, several dozen clients. And we anecdotally, as we correct these errors, see major differences among different regions of the states, harms to the, uh, because of the complexity of the guidelines and the piecemeal fashion in which new enhancements have been added, and the impact of double counting, whether it's habitual offenses or prior record variables being scored again and again. It's been small scale for us anecdotal information we see, and I'm very excited now to put that together with Safe and Just Michigan and their examination of nearly 39,000 sentences that have been imposed for life offenses under the legislative guidelines. Today, we'll hopefully start to balance that work, the work that has been done by the pretrial and jail task force on jail sentences and probation, with a look at all those factors that Safe and Just Michigan has put together and, and uh, uh, c collected all the data for in looking at those, those 39,000 sentences and in starting to analyze uh, Michigan's longest sentences, not just the pretrial pieces. In a second, I'll introduce video for the Chief Justice to open the conference, but first, some very quick uh, housekeeping notes. First, thanks to the conference staff and everyone who put this together. Um, I see uh, my fellow board member Joe Hoveman is here, and the staff conference committee, Kate McCracken, Veronica French, Valerie Franson, and for all their work, and then to John Cooper and the rest of the Safe and Just Michigan team for, uh, for today's event. Thanks to Barb Levine, Ann Maher, and Justin Smith, who put together the report that everybody has, and the hours and hours of work that went in, into that. Um, there, in keeping with uh, CDC uh, recommendations and the rules of uh, the hotel, everyone's encouraged to wear masks when indoors, when not eating. Uh, meeting room, of course, is set up to allow social distancing seating, and hand sanitizer is available. We'll have a morning break at 11 o'clock. Lunch is scheduled for 12.15. Um, restrooms are down the hall and on the left. The internet password is winter21, all lowercase. Uh, good, easy one to remember. Um, index cards are in front of everybody, and questions can be written for the sentencing panel this afternoon. They'll be collected uh, before and after lunch. And with that, uh, I think uh, we should get rolling. Um, this, the kickoff is the uh, video from Chief Justice uh, Bridget Mary McCormick. She's on vacation and couldn't be here in person, but uh, we all know she's been chief now, I think, uh, for, for several years. She joined the Michigan Supreme Court in 2013, Chief Justice since uh, 2019. And prior to, to joining the Michigan Supreme Court, she was on the faculty and, uh, and an assistant dean of the clinical programs at Michigan Law School. So with that, uh, I'll turn it over to that video. Good morning, friends. I am sorry I am not with you today, but happy to have this opportunity to wish you well and thank you for your work. We've made so much progress in Michigan on criminal justice reform. 
the expungement package, the jail and pretrial bills that have already been signed into law, the new legislation that's pending. We raised the age and there's more to come in juvenile justice. And we've gotten all this done because we have a bipartisan collaborative approach to justice system improvement in Michigan. Complex problems are only solved when surrounded by all the stakeholders who trust in one another and approach them with goodwill. I see that over and over again in Michigan. And Safe and Just Michigan has been an integral part of all of it. You also know there is a lot more to do. And you know how important it is to do it. And today you'll start tackling one of the hardest problems in our criminal legal system, felony sentencing. When the legislature passed the sentencing guidelines in 1998, it aimed to make sentencing across the state consistent and proportional to the offense and the offender. Its recommended sentences reflected those general goals and also captured the policy preferences of that moment. Since 1998, the legislature has amended the guidelines piecemeal, responding to court decisions interpreting them in some cases and to reflect other priorities in other cases. And court decisions without legislative response have also impacted some aspects of them too. Unlike in many other states, Michigan does not have a sentencing commission to evaluate whether the guidelines are meeting their goals on an ongoing basis to make sure that legislative amendments and court interpretations don't cause disruption that undermines the overall goals and to recommend changes when needed to serve those goals. So today, all of you will start that conversation. How have the guidelines worked out? Have they served the goals they hoped they would? If not, why not? And what have we learned since 1998 that might make us refine our goals? What has research and practice taught us that might allow us to better target our priorities and our policies? Long sentences are one of the hardest problems in criminal legal system reform. They usually reflect distressing facts. People have been hurt. And the guidelines themselves are complicated and hard to understand. Data about how they are working isn't easy to come by and apples to apples comparisons harder still. But thanks to Barb Levine, Ann Maher and Justin Smith, we now have the comprehensive history and the data to start this conversation. Thank you to, to them and to Safe and Just Michigan for the work to get us here and for taking this next step today. If not now, when? And if not here in Michigan, where? We know we can build a justice system that works for everyone, that accountability and healing are not in conflict, and that if we get it right, we will have a safe and just Michigan. Thank you for your work. So with that, uh, to start things, we are really fortunate today to have a keynote, keynote speaker who can give us a lot of breadth and depth about the sentencing guidelines and what they mean and to be able for, to, for us to compare that to other states so we can see where we are in Michigan and, uh, and, and perhaps uh, uh, have more uh, context for where other places are. Kelly Lynn Mitchell is the Executive Director of the Robina Institute of Criminal Law and Criminal Justice. She has served as Chair of the Minnesota Sentencing Guidelines Commission since 2019 and as President of the National Association of Sentencing Commissions from 2014 to 2017. Mitchell was the Executive Director of the Minnesota Sentencing Guidelines Commission from 2011 to 2014 and worked as a staff attorney and manager for the Minnesota Judicial Branch from 2001 to 2011, where she served as the branch's liaison to other criminal justice agencies and was responsible for several statewide programs and services, such as drug courts, the court interpreter program, and examiner services for sex offender civil commitment exams. Ms. Mitchell. Well, thanks everyone for having me today. It's really an honor to be here as you uh, start this journey to talk about, you know, where do you want to go next with the Michigan Sentencing Guidelines, with the Michigan Sentencing Guidelines. Um, you know, I think uh, I, I really appreciate being asked to, to be here today. You know, it, if you paid attention to the bio, which was too long, you'll, you'll, you will have heard that I've both served as the chair of the Minnesota Commission and also as its executive director in the past. So I've had experience from both sides trying to figure out how to staff that group, what information they needed, what, um, what would be useful 
as the commission did its work, and also trying to lead that commission in terms of policy change. And so today, really what I've been asked to do here today is to talk to you primarily about what the, what the goals of a commission are and what the importance is of having a sentencing commission within your state. But I'm also gonna take podium privilege to talk a little bit about how Michigan's guidelines differ from other systems across the country. Because at the Rabina Institute, we're actually the only institute in the nation that has expertise on all guideline systems across the country. So I have, I have that understanding comparatively of how your guidelines work compared to other systems. Although I will say, I don't know if anybody knows how your guidelines work because they are the most complex guidelines that <laughs> exist. Other, maybe, you know, maybe with the exception of the federal guidelines. So you two are, are one and two in terms of complexity, um, but that's okay, we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out. So that, these are the two things I'll talk about today. All right, so there's really two types of sentencing commissions across the country. The first type really is the, the old guard type, which is what Minnesota was. The commission that was formed to embark on this, this, new, this new exercise of developing sentencing guidelines commissions, and then uh, developing sentencing guidelines, and then monitoring, reviewing them, keeping them up to date. So the Minnesota Commission was formed 40 years ago. We had the first set of guidelines that were, that were enacted in the country. There were several other commissions that came to life during that era as well. In the 2000s, the commissions that began to crop up were more uh, brought, brought forward to, to develop policy solutions for states. So a lot of the newer commissions tend to be broader based uh, and they work sometimes on sentencing guidelines and sometimes on all criminal justice issues within the, within the, within the, um, within the state. So those are the two kinds. And if we look at this chart up here, the states that, have, that are in dark blue have both a commission and sentencing guidelines. The states that are in the mid-range um, have sentencing commissions but no guidelines, so they tend to just work on criminal justice policy recommendations for the states. And then the states that, the four states that are light blue are the states that started out with guidelines and a commission, and somewhere along the way their commission fell off and went out of business, um, but the guidelines remain in the system. I'd say that Tennessee is sort of the, the one state that we, it's a bit of a stretch to say that they're a guideline system. They have the guidelines embedded in their legislative code, but there's really, no one's been minding the store since about 1994. So it's, it's become just the underlying structure for sentencing that the legislature now controls with, with regular updates. Missouri is, is a, Missouri's commission fell away uh, just a few years ago. They're actually trying to get that restarted again as well. Um, you know the situation in Michigan. And in Florida, it's really the Department of Corrections that's kept their guidelines going because they're continuing to monitor and, and track data. So, so you can actually see what's going on in Florida because the data is there to see it, but there's no body at the helm trying to help control policy in that state or to help uh, you know, adjust the guidelines as needed. So that's sort of the state of play. We're gonna focus on the dark blue states there as we continue, as I continue to talk about um, guideline systems. Sorry, there's a little bit of a delay, so there we go. All right, so guidelines commissions can be placed in any branch of government, really doesn't matter. Most are an independent agency within the executive branch, but several are also located within the judicial branch or the legislative branch. And, and really, what's more important is that the agency be independent and that it have staff to support their work. So where they're located is not as important as how they're structured. Whoops, oh, see? He told me there'd be a delay, but did I listen? No. All right, so here's, a, here's a, the commission sizes can range across 
across the, the systems. So you'll see the Federal Sentencing Commission has seven members, whereas the North Carolina Sentencing Commission has 28 members. And, you know, there's no magic number as to who needs to be included on a commission. It's really all about how inclusive do you need that group to be. The larger uh, sizes tend to be associated with commissions that have a larger role in criminal justice policy because they're trying to be more inclusive of all the voices that need to be heard to set criminal, criminal justice policy in the state. So Utah is an example of that where they have, you know, quite a variety of, of members. Of members, I would say, just don't copy the feds because they only have seven members. They didn't even include a defense attorney on their commission. Um, so it's a it's a very unbalanced view. It's actually located within the judicial branch, and most of the members are actually judges on that particular commission. There's nothing wrong with that, but it's like they have judges, they have a prosecutor, they don't have a defense attorney. So it's it's a little unbalanced in that way. The commissions that are in the middle probably have a little bit more balance in terms of membership. So here's the type of people that tend to be on sentencing commissions. Judges and prosecutors are on just about every commission that's out there. Defense attorneys, you know, all the sort of usual suspects that you would uh, figure are, are on most commissions. It gets a little interesting when you look at, you know, only about half of the commissions that are active today have law enforcement or victims or victims advocate members. Only about half have members of the public and only about half have members of the legislature. I find the legislator members um, line particularly interesting. We don't have legislators on our commission in Minnesota. And we actually struggle sometimes where we've had very detailed conversations at the commission level of you know what's going on in this area. And then we have this huge re-education process, you know, when we try to bring that topic to the legislature. Whereas in Pennsylvania, they have legislators on their commission. And so it's kind of already built in. They've been that, that line of communication with the legislature is open right from the beginning. So if I were to sort of recommend any group in this list to make sure you have, um, if you want to change policy within the state, that's the group I would recommend. And then, of course, I think actually all of the others above it are essential, public victims, public defense, corrections officials. I would actually add probation to that list because a lot of our sentences are probation. Um, you know, defense attorneys, prosecutors, judges, all the usual players there. Commission staff size is also really important to think about. And as you can see from this chart, it varies a lot across the country. The, the, the commissions that are listed with bullets actually don't have any staff members dedicated to them and tend to be and are, are supported by some other agency within the state. And um, the commissions that have only two members, you know, those are going to be commissions that tend to really only focus on policy. You know, what should the policy of the sentencing guidelines be? And that's because with two people, that's about all that you can do is try to develop agendas for the commission, try to do the research that's necessary. Some of those states do have other agencies within the state that might provide some support in terms of data analysis. But the trouble with having that sort of dual responsibility there is that if it's not within your agency, then you don't control what the staff does, right? So you don't control the priority of whether or not the commission is going to be able to get that data analysis when they need it. So the commissions that are at least a little bit bigger, five, six, seven, ten members, or you know, ten staff members, usually have researchers on staff who can collect data and help the commission uh, put, that, put that information in front of the commission so the commission can be doing data-driven kind of decision-making, understanding how are the guidelines actually working in practice, where are the issues coming up. If we're seeing a weird sentencing patterns somewhere, they can kind of look under the hood and try to figure out which factors might be contributing to that. So and on the other end, I didn't put the, the outlier on this that's not showing is that the federal system has about 100 employees. 
So that might be a little extreme, um, but maybe more than two uh, would be effective. Okay, sorry. So these are, um, you know, most commissions as yours. Oops, thank you. I'm never going to get this down, I think. Can you push it to the next slide? Oh, I went like way back. Next one. There we go. That's fine. We'll just leave it there. Um, okay. So uh, here in Michigan, this is true as well. When you when you did have a commission, but most commissions, when they are created by the legislature, there's some sort of enabling statute that sets forth what the responsibilities of that commission are and what sorts of things they should be doing. And it runs the gamut from developing those guidelines in the first place to collecting data, analyzing it, understanding it, creating projections for um, prison populations, understanding the effect of the guidelines, in other words, on your correctional capacity, your correctional resources, and uh, maybe even developing racial impact uh, assessments of, of your policies. So the, the whole list here is sort of, if you take all of those enabling statutes and distill them down to the main priorities of commissions, the whole list here is what, um, what, what, what comes up across the majority of systems. There's other things randomly that the commissions are asked to do, but this is sort of the core of what most commissions do. And the four that I've um, circled are what I consider to be really the absolute core of what commission work is. So what I'm gonna do over the next couple of slides is to take each one in turn and talk about what a commission can do within that, within that bucket and what that can do for your state. All right. Let's see if this is working. Okay. All right, so most commissions that are, t so the first one is collect, I'm actually, okay, back up one step. The top one was develop guidelines. I'm gonna talk about that last. I'm gonna talk about the other things first, the more administrative type work of the commission. Then we'll talk about development of guidelines, and then that's where I'll get into a little bit about what I see as being unique about your guidelines compared to other systems. All right, so if we talk first about collecting and analyzing data, most commissions do find a way to collect data regularly on all the sentences that are um, pronounced within the state. Most start on paper, right? Like the sentencing order gets sent to the commission and there's somebody there who's pulling data elements off that piece, that piece of paper and creating a database. Hopefully, eventually you get to a place where that data is being sent automatically, you know, through a computer feed to the commission and it's just filling up their database. And the longer you do that over time, the more you can do with that information. And you can use that data to both get to a granular understanding of what's going on with sentencing and also an overtime trend line understanding of what's going on with sentencing. So here's an example of the more granular type of data that you might be able to understand. So this is part of an annual report that's produced by the Maryland Sentencing Commission. Um, and this is a report that's showing sentencing for some of their main person offenses. So the first line that's up there, hopefully you can see, is assault in the second degree. Assault in the second degree for them. And so one thing that they can tell, if you look at the underlying data, they can tell what percentage of these cases are actually following the guidelines when they're being sentenced. So it's about, um, it's too small on my thing, is it about 70% up there, 65? Someone yell out, 65, 70, what is it? Oh, 85, okay, see, I can't see from here. So 85% of the sentences for assault in the second degree are within the presumptive guidelines range. The boxes next to that show how many are mi mitigated sentences, so lower than the presumptive guidelines, and what percent are higher than that. They can also, in, Mich in Maryland, tell 
well, what are the actual sentences that are meted out for this? So the first line there is like, what's the average sentence that a person is actually getting for this offense? And then next to that, what's the average sentence, the average time they're serving when you take into account any stayed time that might have been pronounced? So Maryland gets very detailed in terms of what sentencing really looks like offense by offense by offense. They can actually give you that level of information. This is um, the kind of trend line information that you can get. So this is from um, Minnesota. This is, our, this is a graph from the, the reports of the legislature that we just gave uh, to, uh, in Minnesota. And this is showing incarceration rates, right? So in Minnesota, we consider incarceration to be both who went to prison and also who received some sort of jail time along with a prison, uh, probation sentence. So the, the, the dark blue line at the very top is what's the incarceration rate overall for everybody who was sentenced for a felony. And we can see the, um, the trend line all the way from 1982 to today. And then the green line there is what's the uh, conditional confinement, what jail time was somebody ordered to serve along, what percentage of people got a jail sentence along with their probation sentence. Um, so we can see the trend line is pretty similar there to the, the, overall, the overall trend line because most people in Minnesota get probation. And then the light blue at the bottom is the prison, imprisonment rate. And we can see all the way back to 1982 what percentage of people received uh, an imprisonment rate. And you can see that we've kept it fairly steady throughout that period of time. The dotted line is showing, well, if you look at what the sentence should have been under the guidelines, how many people should have received, or what's the proportion of people that should have received um, prison. And you can see that the guidelines policy is pushing the prison rate up, but the judges, the court, is keeping the imprisonment rate down, sort of at an even, an even rate, because that gap is getting a little bit wider, a little bit wider there. So we're actually, that little jaunt up at the very end, we are concerned about that as a commission right now because we don't know what's causing that. We know what's caused some of the other little jumps up. We had legislation that passed that called for more incarceration, so we expected that number to go up. But all of a sudden, in the last couple, two years, it's gone up and we haven't done anything. So. Now we're trying, we're trying to look under the hood to figure that out. We think it's criminal history that's actually driving that, but we're not sure. So that's actually, we actually have a team working on trying to figure that out right now. But that is what we can do as a sentencing commission. We can actually pay attention to what those trends are and figure them out. This is the demographic, um, the demographics of the people who've been convicted of a felony in Minnesota going all the way back to 1981 when the guidelines were first enacted. And so the, the big dark blue section of this chart, those are people who are white within that population. The green section are people who are black. Blue is people who are Native American. And there's a couple of areas on here where we can see major shifts in the policy or in, in the demographics. I'm trying, I want to try to get them all to come up. It's not clicking. Can you click it two more times? Perfect. All right. All right. So we can see in the 90s, the proportion of people who were black started to increase greatly. That was actually when our drug laws were enacted, right? So we had a big uh, shift in who was being convicted for felony offenses. You can see in the early 2000s, there's a bump up in the proportion of people who were white. That was when we first enacted felony DWI, and those are more often committed by people who are white. So the proportion of people who were white went up during that time. More concerning is the proportion of people who are Native American more recently has actually um, started to, to shift quite a bit. It's getting, it's getting really large. For Minnesota, the Native American population is 1% of our population, but you can see that they are several percentages of our um, total felony population. So that is an area where we are greatly concerned right now, and we're trying to figure out 
what is causing that shift to see if there's any policy recommendations that we could make that might uh, bring that population down to something closer to their proportion within the, the population within the state. But if we didn't have this data over time, if we weren't looking at it by demographics, we wouldn't know any of this. We wouldn't have had an opportunity to check and figure out what was going on anywhere with this. Um, but right now, you know, racial equity is, is a priority within our state. So we're really trying to, to work on all of those numbers and get them to closer to uh, mirror the population more closely. All right, so that was what a commission can do uh, if, if you're with data, if you collect and analyze sentencing data, all kinds of things that you can do. The other thing that a lot of commissions are tasked with doing, and our commission is as well, is um, helping the state project the prison population so that you can actually figure out what resources you need and also um, you know, where, what priority do you want to place on those resources as well. So this is the prison population projection in a recent report from the Kansas Sentencing Commission. You can see 2020 was a really weird year for everybody, so obviously their prison population fell like everybody else's. Um, but so the blue part of the line is the actual prison population. The orange part is what they're projecting the population to be. So number one, you can just simply use the information if you know, if you have certainty in sentencing that's brought on by the guidelines, I'll talk about that a little bit more later. If you have certainty in sentencing and you have an idea of how long people are actually going to serve, then you have this ability to figure out what your churn rate's going to be in the, in the prison and how policy is going to affect that overall population. In Kansas, there's also, um, the Kansas is also required to do an assessment every year to figure out if their system is going to get to the point of reaching or exceeding prison capacity. And if they are, then that commission is specifically tasked with bringing to the legislature ideas for bringing that capacity back down. How do we get back in line with the capacity that we have? In Kansas, it's important to them that they're not in a position of building new prisons. So that's what they, so they use their commission to help stay within the capacity that they have. I've had the privilege of going down there and the way that that commission works is that each fall, if they have that type of assessment and they know that they're in that situation, then they have a two day retreat. Their commission goes on a two day retreat and they think they throw every idea they can, you know, on the table and they talk through it. They get presentations from experts to help them understand the implications of those changes and they start to develop what are the ideas that we could send to the legislature to offset this change so that we can bring that capacity back in? And then they, they send them off and, you know, sometimes the legislature passes those items, sometimes they don't, but there again, that's a commission that has legislators on it. So oftentimes all that work they've done at that two-day retreat is really useful because when they get to the point of going into session, they do have uh, really knowledgeable members of the legislature that can help explain some of the ideas to their, to their, co their counterparts. All right, so that's the Produce Correctional Population uh, Forecast. The other idea is to use the data to actually look at the fiscal and racial impact of any policy changes. So this is both legislative policy changes and policy changes that the commission itself might make to the guidelines. So this is an example of a fiscal impact analysis. This is, this is an example from Minnesota. In the past session, uh, the Minnesota legislature introduced a bill to change the, the offense that we would normally know as um, being a patron of prostitution or buying, being a person who purchases sex, the legislature wanted to take that crime and, and move it over to a new crime called sef, sex trafficking. And as they were doing that, they were gonna add this to the, uh, crime, the definition of crimes of violence. They were going to um, subject repeat offenders to more severe punishments. 
and they were going to uh, change the law so that judges could not do a downward departure on the sentence. So the, the specific way that they were going to constrain judicial discretion was that they were going to say if the, if the sentence calls for prison, the judge cannot impose a probation sentence. So this is the projection that the commission made of, well, how many prison beds will that result in? In 2022 and 2023, really minimal, not very many. You go all the way out to the end, and it's about 18 prison beds for, per year from that year on. That would be the projection. And if you look at, whoops, went too far back. If you look at this section right here that I've circled very beautifully, um, what you'll see is that that decision to constrain the judicial discretion so that they couldn't impose a probation sentence is where most of those beds would have come from. So, um, so really, we can get specific on what part of the law change is going to result in prison beds. So the way it works in our state is that this information gets added to the spreadsheets for the committees that are trying to balance the budget for the, uh, you know, criminal justice policy bill for that year. And our legislature has to cover both the near-term and the long-term costs, right? So near-term, it would have cost them nothing. Long-term, it would have started to cost them something. So they'd have to decide, can we cover that expense out in the future? Is it a priority for us? So sometimes when we see a bill that has a number of beds attached to it, the legislature will look at it and say, we can't afford that. We're not going to, this isn't a good bill for us. We can't, we can't pay for that cost. We're not going to build a new prison. We're not going to add capacity somewhere. So we're not willing to cover it. Other times they'll say, you know, no, we actually think that this bill is this, this crime uh, really merits those beds. So they'll come up with legislation somewhere else that will reduce beds and that'll offset the change. So that's the kind of, um, the kind, of, the kind of information that we can give the legislature so they can make those policy choices as they go. And I've seen both happen. I've seen a high fiscal note, you know, kill a bill. I've also seen a high fiscal note result in bargaining so that something else that used to result in prison no longer does. This is um, an example of a racial impact that the commission might want to do. So the same bill. As I mentioned, this, this particular um, table shows actually more than just racial impact. It shows what's the impact of that bill by gender, what's the impact of that bill by race, and also judicial district. I cut that off, but the first and second, that's the first two rows of all the judicial districts in the state. So we could actually tell where in the state would those beds come from. So what we're showing here is that you know, of the 18 beds that were projected, they would all go to males, right? So no females would be sent to prison for this bill. But 16 of those beds would be for men who are black. So there's a high racial impact for this particular bill. So the legislature would need to weigh that as well as, they, as they're thinking through whether this is a bill that they actually want to pass. As it turns out, the legislature kicked the can down the road and sent it to us at the commission for further evaluation uh, to figure out, you know, is this the way that we should be sentencing sex trafficking or not? So we'll be reporting back to them next year. Um, all right, so now let's get to the big one. The big purpose of many commissions is to develop sentencing guidelines, monitor them, uh, and review and revise as needed. So just to make sure everybody in the room understands what I mean by that, sentencing guidelines are a set of standards that are generally put in place to establish uh, rational and consistent sentencing practices within a particular jurisdiction. In most systems, the, the, the goals of the guidelines are to foster proportionality, secure public safety, reduce disparity, manage correctional capacity, achieve certainty in sentencing. So we went through a couple of those, those ideas already in terms of how the commission can help to achieve those goals. Sentencing guidelines are not top-level policy. They're mid-level policy, and they are policy. They're not case-level decisions. 
So the legislature's role in all of these systems is to define crimes and to set the maximum punishment for what those crimes should be. And so that's, that's what they do. Down at the case level, judges impose sentences in individual level cases, and they should be taking individual level concerns into account when they set those sentences. In the middle there, what a sentencing commission and sentencing guidelines can do is take that top level policy and break it down so that we can understand when we're looking at a person with these types of uh, characteristics who's committed this type of crime, what's an appropriate sentence for that case? Not individually, before you take in those into account, those individual characteristics that the judge should be thinking about. So it's a mid-level policy. It takes like that 20 year maximum sentence that might be on the books for assault and it breaks it down so that you can say, well, if it's an assault that results in injury, it's this kind of, uh, this kind of punishment's appropriate. If it's an assault um, that is involving a weapon, maybe this level of punishment is appropriate. And also taking into account the criminal history of the individual. So this is, um, this is a, what a more simple sentencing grid looks like, a little simpler than what you have here in Michigan. Most systems have only one to maybe three grids. I think here it's nine or 11, nine, nine, yeah. And so um, what, a more, a, what a, a little bit of a simpler system looks like, uh, this is Minnesota's grid. And we had this grid, actually it was our only grid until 2006. Blakely actually, actually caused us to break some of the sentences out onto a separate grid. Um, but until 2006, we put everything on here. And the way that our grid works is that the horizontal, the up and down axis is the offense severity. So that's looking at taking all offenses, pitted against each other, uh, where do they fall in terms of seriousness? With the least serious being at the bottom of the grid, the most serious being at the top of the grid. And then across the, the horizontal axis is our criminal history score. And so that's just breaking down that maximum sentence into other sentences that are more appropriate depending on the person's criminal history. And every system that has a criminal history score, it, it might be a number on the grid, but it's usually a composite of multiple factors. So that's, that you know one or zero represents not just a counting up of priors, but um, you know looking at those priors and maybe potentially adding some weights to them uh, potentially uh, having decay factors in there so that certain crimes don't crime don't count after a certain period of time, considering whether to have juveniles uh, crimes count at, at all, which not every system does. So there's a lot of a lot of policy that goes into what that criminal history score is. But unlike Michigan, there's usually not a lot of policy that goes into what the offense severity is. That is generally just a ranking decision that's made by the commission. And I'll talk about that a little bit more down the road. All right. Oh, and I'll just show you on our grid, the way it works is that if, it, if the, if the, if the uh, cross section of those two factors hits a shaded cell, that means that probation is the presumptive sentence. If it hits a white cell, then the prison is the presumptive sentence and the numbers that are in the grid represent the presumptive duration. So the other sort of key concept in the development of sentencing guidelines is that they should be uh, for the most, for the typical offense. So wherever you end up with uh, on that grid should be sort of the average case. It's not the um, most egregious case that you might've heard about in the news. It's also not the least serious case that might be before you because of other factors that have gone on in that person's life. So it's typical, Pennsylvania calls it the heartland case. This is the sort of, you know, looking at all the varieties of ways that crimes can be committed, this is sort of where it comes to on average. If there's situations within that case that require some sort of adjustment to that sentence though, most systems also allow for that and that's called the departure sentence. And so departures are, are appropriate either up or down when there are atypical circumstances in that case. 
All right, so what does it look like to monitor the application of the guidelines? So here is, here's two ways you could do that. Again, I'm sorry, I'm falling back on Minnesota as a, an example here because it's easy to pull from our data report. But on the, um, on the left, we have the, the pie chart, and that shows you know, what proportion of guidelines of sentences of all felonies fell within the presumptive range on the guidelines each year. So you can see that the, that's the biggest part of the pie, 75% of about three quarters of cases fell into that range. The other quarter of cases were some sort of a departure, and you can see for Minnesota, the dark blue are mitigated departures. So the majority of the departures in Minnesota are mitigated. There's a small slice for aggravated. That number used to be about 5%, but after Blakely and that progeny of cases, uh, you know, got a little harder to, to, to depart upward in Minnesota. So that number has come down a bit. On the right side, um, so this is high level compliance. Like we know that about three quarters of cases fall within the guidelines. On the right side, we can look offense by offense to see what are the compliance rates for, for particular offenses. And this is a chart that we show where we show the sort of problem children of what's going on in sentencing in Minnesota. And for all of these offenses, the departure rate is at or above 50%. So that's a signal to the commission that there's something going on there, that, that you know, one possibility is the system could be giving us a communication back that the guidelines that we've set don't make sense and that we need to relook at them and maybe bring them down. If all, the if all the departures are mitigated, then maybe that's a signal that the sentences are too harsh under the guidelines. Another thing that could be going on is there could be something about the way the statute is written that's problematic. So assault in the second degree, the first bar, the first bar there. For that, that's, that's assault with a deadly weapon in Minnesota. And in Minnesota, a deadly weapon is defined broadly and in some cases, there's case law that shows that, you know, a boxer's hands could be a deadly weapon, um, but a gun could also be a deadly weapon. So you can imagine that it's really hard to set the right sentence when you have that broad range of behavior that could um, constitute the same type of crime. So that's a situation where we actually have a problem with the statute. Right? The guidelines like, can't set a sentence that will satisfy the field because the statute's written too broadly. There's other um, instances, too, where we have you know, some statutes that have mandatory minimums but also a safety valve on them, and those tend to have high departure rates as well. So that's a communication to both of us, right? The guidelines say if there's a mandatory minimum, that overrides whatever sentence the guidelines would have imposed. The, uh, the safety valve says you can ignore the mandatory minimum, and so in half the cases people are, and in half the cases people aren't. So there's a problem both ways. Um, so that's what, that's what sort of knowing what these kinds of departure rates are can help us explore and understand and determine if we need to make a change, if we need to recommend that the legislature make a change, or if both of us need to change. Guidelines um, monitoring also means looking at your own policies to see how they play out. So not just all the other statutes that define criminal conduct, but the actual guidelines policies, which in some states exist outside of statute, in some states exist within the statutes. So um, here's an example from Maryland. In Maryland, they do include juvenile adjudications as part of the criminal history score. And so one year during their normal public comment period, somebody asked the commission to take a look at how juvenile adjudications were being scored because they felt that there was some disparity occurring within that. So the commission decided to take that issue up. They started to look under the hood and they found out the way that their juvenile point was working was that you would get a heavier weight to the point if the juvenile had been committed to the Department of Corrections and a lighter weight if they hadn't. 
And what they found out is that that concept of commitment varied across the state. So in some places, committed to the Department of Corrections meant committed to a juvenile facility akin to a car incarceration, right? In other places, committed to the Department of Corrections just meant under their supervision. So some kids who really were not, didn't have very serious juvenile crimes were getting the highest possible weight on that juvenile portion of the criminal history score. And when they looked at that by racial demographics, they found out that people, the kids who were black were, being, were getting the short end of that stick more often. So they were more often getting those harsher versions of the penalty. So the commission decided to redesign their score so that it would be more equitably um, applied across the system. They took out that definition of commitment. They based it more on the offense that the juvenile committed, and they're hoping that that will uh, sort of even things out. They just did that recently, so they haven't been able to evaluate the effect of the change yet, but, but they're really trying to minimize that, that disparate impact on kids who are black. So that's another thing you can do, is look at your own policy. All right, so let's talk about a couple of the key decisions that commissions often make when they're developing sentencing guidelines. And so I'll talk about that in Michigan's context and how I see some, some things that happen, happened here that are a little different than the way they were decided across other states. So the first item is, you know, whether or not there is a parole, whether or not parole is continued in the state. Many states that, that created sentencing guidelines also at the same time decided to eliminate parole so that they would have more determinate sentencing. But that wasn't the case everywhere. About half of the systems retained parole and about half of them eliminated parole at the same time. For this, just want you to notice that for the states where parole is retained, four of those states no longer have commissions though. So the guidelines are not, I think, I would argue, are not exerting as much of an influence in those states as they once did. For the other nine states, six guidelines set the top of the range when a judge is, is pronouncing sentence. Only three set the minimum range, as Michigan does. That one state is Utah, and they, do, they just do something completely different. Their guidelines just help the parole board determine how long the sentence should be. So here's, let me talk a little bit about what that means to have your guidelines set the minimum versus the maximum range. So if we take a 20 year statutory maximum sentence, if the, um, let's assume that the court sets a 10 year, uh, a 10 year sentence. First, let's talk about setting the max. If the court sets a 10 year sentence in a, in a system where the guidelines set the maximum, then what that means is that the parole board no longer has discretion over those last 10 years, right? So the max, setting the maximum sets not only sort of the, the constrains the sentence, but also constrains the discretion of the parole board. The court under this system could also set the minimum sentence, and then the space between the minimum, min, min and the max would be the area that the parole board has discretion to determine release. In contrast, in a system where the court sets the minimum, like in Florida and Michigan, the stat max is still out there as the maximum. So the parole's discretion is that whole range from the minimum to the maximum. That's the difference in making that sort of a decision. Pennsylvania is the only other state that uses the guidelines to set the minimum, but when they've made that choice, they also put in place a rule that calibrates the maximum sentence to that minimum sentence. So the max is actually double the minimum there. So when the court sets the minimum in Pennsylvania, it also changes what that, um, how far out the maximum can go. So double the minimum is the max. The parole board does not have discretion over the rest of that time. It's not available to them. So that's sort of the difference in what how uh, in that decision of how to use your guidelines to set the, the sentence. The parole discretion moves from that big zone down to just that, that distance between the minimum term and the maximum term. 
So now let's look at the, how the ranges work here and then how they interplay with that maximum sentence. So this is um, one of the rows on uh, grid B for, for Michigan. And what you can see is that if we look at the, the ranges for just the bottom, don't even look at the habitual sender offender ranges yet, that they increase, they not only increase um, in duration as you go across the grid, they also increase in width as you go across the grid. So what that does is that that means that judicial discretion for where to set the minimum term is actually getting wider as you move down the grid. So then as you, if you try to apply that to this concept of the min versus the max, like I just mentioned, at the lowest criminal history score on the Michigan grid, what that means is the judge has this sort of narrow range within which they can set the minimum term, but the parole board has a lot of room to work in terms of determining what the actual sentence of that person will be because they'll determine when they get out. And then when we get to the highest um, prior record score, the judge has a lot more room to work within and the parole board has less room to work within because now the judge is setting that, that number uh, way far out there, but they have a lot of room to work within. The difference in Pennsylvania, the other state like you that has parole and guidelines and uses the guidelines to set a minimum term, is that in Pennsylvania, the ranges are pretty even as you go across the grid. Every single row you look at, the distance is about the same. That means that the judge's um, discretion is about the same width no matter where they sentence on the grid. So judicial discretion is, is fairly even across the board. And then when you look at, um, now when you add to that the fact that the minimum sets the maximum by the doubling rule, judicial discretion is still fairly narrow. The, the parole board's discretion is also still fairly, fairly narrow but each sort of uh, increases appropriately as the severity of the offense increases as well, or as the criminal history of the offender increases as well. The sort of net result of all of this is that in Michigan, you have a high degree of uncertainty in sentencing because of the fact that judges have these wide ranges within which they can set the minimum term, and the parole board has all the room in the world to work with because they work with the, stat, the full stat max. And then that uncertainty is exacerbated when you think about how the habitual offender ranges just increase the, the, the time within which the judge has to work. Whereas in Pennsylvania, they can get to a fair degree of certainty in sentencing because the guidelines set the minimum and state law sets that maximum at double the minimum sentence. How am I doing on time? Do I, do I need to wrap up? Okay. <laughs> Felt like I was... All right. All right, just a couple more concepts. So one other concept is um, real offense versus conviction offense sentencing. This is another, another policy area that all commissions have to grapple with when they think about how to set up their guidelines. So in a conviction offense system, what the four corners of that offense say in the, legislate, in the, in, in the law is what defines your sentence, right? So, so um, if, the, if the offense itself uh, doesn't include a gun, even if there's an allegation in the case that a gun was used, if that's not the offense you're convicted of with a gun, then you're not going to be sentenced for an offense with a gun. So really, it's whatever is in that conviction offense that matters. And what this emphasizes is the importance of the criminal code, the importance of proving all elements of the offense uh, without a reasonable doubt or beyond a reasonable doubt. In a real offense sentencing system, the sort of offense that you're convicted of is just the starting point and other facts can be brought in, often proved by clear and convincing evidence, which is the lower standard, and they can affect the sentence. Most systems don't use that. So in 11 of the 15 guideline systems, um, the, the offense you're convicted of really drives the sentence. In only, only the other four do facts that are not part of the offense affect 
where the sentence falls within the guidelines and, and on the grids. So as an example of what that means, here again is, you know, I showed you the Minnesota's grid before. It's not that we don't have offenses that have different elements in them. So if you look at our assault statute or you look at our burglary statute, of course we have multiple types of burglary, right? One of them might be burglary of a home with a person in it, burglary of a home with a person not in it. But each one of those is an offense that's defined in the statute. And if you want to convict somebody of burglary of a, of a home where when somebody is there, you better, you know, that has to be the offense that they're actually charged with. You have to prove those elements and you need to convict them of that offense in order to get that sentence. So you can see that we have burglary ranked at three different places because it's defined three different ways in our statutes, right? Same thing with theft, uh, the amount of theft matters to the seriousness. And so that's ranked at two different places because the dollar amount changes depending on where it's ranked. So the commission did that work of looking at all the elements of the offenses and figuring out how things rank against each other. And like I said, for you know, most of our existence, all of the offenses were on one grid. So we could tell how things ranked across the entire criminal code against each other up until 2006 when we pulled the sex offenses off. So when the commission does those ranking decisions, we're looking at what are the elements of the offense, what is the type and amount of harm, what is the statutory maximum punishment, all that goes into where the offense is ranked on the grid to begin with. Those are not factual decisions that have to be made in the court. So that's one thing that's unique about Michigan is a lot of those a lot of those are factors that are, that are coming into play at the time of sentencing here. Only three states um, allow additional facts to affect the offense seriousness. That's Alabama, Maryland, and Virginia. And in those states, it's pretty limited what they allow to change that, and it's primarily weapons use, victim injury, victim age. All right, and then the last topic I'll hit is enforceability. These are generally the factors that sort of help determine whether or not uh, an offense, whether or not guideline systems are enforceable. One of them is requiring the court to state reasons for departure. So you can't just do it. You have to put on the record exactly why that departure is occurring. Second one is having not only what not only state those reasons, but have a standard to measure that departure against. Um, a lot of states use substantial and compelling circumstances. That, that's the word that should have been. Allowing appeals of a guideline sentences. Some states um, allow appeals within the range. Often that's for error correction, but it can also allow for an argument such as you should have departed on this sentence because of these facts. Um, allowing appeals of departure sentences for both sides. So prosecution can appeal, so can the defense. And, so, and a lot of states allow both bases for departure, just a full, a full appeal of the sentence regardless of um, which side you're on. And then regularly publishing reports is also a way to bring states into compliance with the guidelines. Pennsylvania is famous for this because they not only publish reports on what sort of how the guidelines are working, but they publish it by judge. And that's sort of a peer pressure uh, way of uh, getting judges to come into compliance in an advisory system where the, where, the judge, where the guidelines are not mandatory. So this is sort of how the states all stack up. And I'll be honest, I cannot figure out how to classify Michigan or the feds. Um, because you have a lot of the elements, both systems have a lot of the elements that um, would make uh, guidelines mandatory. But because both systems have been undercut by case law, uh, they don't function the same way. These, these elements don't work very strongly in the systems anymore. At the federal level, I think we've all seen the reports that there's wide variation depending on what district you're sentenced in, whether or not they, they, they adhere to the guidelines. So it's really hard to classify these systems. Pennsylvania is an advisory system that leans mandatory because they use every single one of those tools to help keep the system in play. And that is it. As I mentioned, we are 
the only institute that's an expert on sentencing guidelines. We actually have a whole website. So if you want to go and look at other systems, you definitely can. And my contact information is there. I don't know if we have time for questions, but I'm happy to take any if we do. Okay, thanks. So the question is, why did the, do we know why the legislature made the ranges so wide? No, <laughs> I mean, I, I honestly can't, I can't um, answer that. But I did look at, you know, um, I did look at other guidelines to see, you know, I, I only compared you on the screen to Pennsylvania because they're the ones that are more, most like you and how in operation. But I did look at other systems to say, to see do other systems ranges also get wider? And a few do, but not to the same degree that Michigan's do. So that, that sort of phenomenon of not only going up in duration and also getting a lot wider as you go down the row is pretty unique to Michigan. Yeah. So I'm not sure if everyone who's on Zoom could hear that, but the comment was made that there's a law in, in, in Michigan that the, um, that the court, that the that the maximum or the minimum cannot be more than two thirds of the statutory maximum sentence. And I did actually check that against the rages and it does look like at the far end that that is what's setting those ranges at the, at the far end of the grid. So the idea might have been that we start there and then work backwards. And that actually is a policy decision that many commissions have had to grapple with. So in a state like mine, where we put this maximum sentence, where the court pronounces the maximum sentence, we had to decide, does the statutory maximum go on the grid anywhere? Or is it okay to have something less than that, even at the highest criminal history score? And in our state, most offenses do not have the stat max on the grid. The exception is the sex offender grid, and that was a deliberate decision made to put the stat max out there on that grid when that was pulled out in 2006 after, after Blakely. So, um, so yeah, that is definitely a policy decision that commissions have to grapple with. Do we have to have that stat max on the grid, or are we comfortable having something lower than that available to the courts, knowing that if they really need to get up there, they also have departures that they could utilize to, to sort of get the rest of the way if they, if they want to. All right, well, that's it for me. Thank you so much for having me again. Thank you to Kelly Mitchell. I know I started as a public defender in Philadelphia, and I was amazed when I moved to Michigan and just saw just how complicated our guidelines were in comparison. So it's very good to hear about the framework in other states. So now we're going to get into the Safe and Just Michigan report, and uh, Barbara Levine will present on the impact of key policy changes on Michigan sentencing guidelines. Barb Levine began her legal career representing indigent defendants on appeal at the State Appellate Defender Office before Michigan had any sentencing guidelines at all. She was the first administrator of the Michigan Appellate Assigned Counsel System, the founder and executive director of the Citizens Alliance on Prisons and Public Spending, which was the predecessor to Safe and Just Michigan, and she was a member of the Criminal Justice Policy Commission. And Barb retired from uh, uh, the predecessor to Safe and Just Michigan and still puts together about 250 page reports. Good morning and thank you all for coming. Um, and thank you especially to Kelly for coming from Minnesota. Um, you provided an enormously helpful framework for everything that's gonna come after for specifically about Michigan. Uh, but you've also been, been a hard act to, created a card, hard act to follow. So uh, not only because of your expertise, but because of your spiffy, sophisticated uh, slides. Now we're going to very few slides in a regular old fashioned kind of speech. So bear with me. Um, our purpose in doing this report was twofold. We are hoping to um, encourage the reestablishment of a sentencing commission uh, when people begin to understand what the need is for it and, and, and what the purposes uh, are to be served. And we also wanted to develop data uh, 
that suggests some of the policy considerations in the areas of research a, new, a newly established commission might want to examine. And we thought this research was needed for several reasons. The guidelines aren't the only determinant of how long people sentenced to prison will actually serve. That's impacted by a lot of other factors, like whether people get paroled at their minimum, whether their offenses carry mandatory minimums that are, that are trumped by the guidelines, uh, whether people got multiple sentences that are imposed to run consecutively. Um, and of course, there's the impact of the elimination of any kind of good time or disciplinary credits in this state. Nonetheless, the guidelines play a critical role as the starting point, the minimum amount of time that somebody's going to have to serve if they're incarcerated. And no commission, having no commission, means that there's been no systematic review of the guidelines as was initially anticipated, as it, as it was meant to be. That the underlying assumptions on which the um, guidelines were built have never been tested. And there's been no analysis of the data about the actual impact of the guidelines on the legislature's goals in, in having guidelines in the first place. So, and of course, ad hoc legislative changes have occurred in the meantime. The guidelines were designed in the mid, 19, mid to late 1990s at the height of the tough on crime era. And attitudes have changed since then. We have much more information about the impact of long sentences and the extent to which that correlates with recidivism. So what we have is a scheme that's been in effect for nearly 25 years and have no idea whether it's meeting the purposes for which the legislature enacted it. So it does seem like it's about time to, to weigh in and take another look. We chose to focus on the four most common life maximum offenses. Murder two, assault with intent to murder, first degree criminal sexual conduct, and armed robbery for several reasons. First, these have the broadest guidelines ranges, so they give the greatest range of discretion um, to judges. This provides the clearest window on how the guidelines are actually working, how judicial discretion is actually being exercised. These are also the cases where the policy of lengthening sentences for the more serious crimes, these are the, these are the cases that policy was designed to affect. And these often involve very long sentences that have the biggest impact on the size and the cost of the prison population on, um, and on the people who... Um, uh, we're serving them, obviously, in the communities from which they come. So, um, our research started in 2013. It began with Elsie Kettinen, who's right over there, uh, who extracted the relevant information from the MDOC's massive database and organized that into data sets, uh, the data sets that underlie this report. And with Justin Smith, who's right over there, um, who did the initial analysis of the data reaching ultimately the same basic conclusions we all we did but setting up the framework for and setting up the framework for the more in-depth examination that we did in the later years we made a lot of progress back in 2013 but life intervened and we stopped pursuing the project temporarily in 2019 Annie Mahar who you will hear from next uh, joined Safe and Just Michigan as a research associate and that um, that allowed us to get the, the data analysis back up and running. As a result of this history, our data ends in 2012. And it's true, of course, that things have changed since then. Uh, and that may cause different sentencing outcomes. New judges have taken the bench. Prosecutors charging and bargaining policies may have changed. Uh, public attitudes about incarceration have started to change. So there's no question that a new commission would want to examine the most recent data. Um, and that re but research is inevitably an ongoing process. Every analysis is a product of a point in time. That said, we now have a great deal of data that will not have to be re-examined. We've answered questions that haven't been asked before, and we've laid the groundwork for future analyses. The broad patterns that we discuss in the report undoubtedly uh, continue to be true, even if some details have changed. And much of the report presents information that doesn't change with time. So if you just skim the table of contents to the report, you'll see that we approach the guidelines from multiple angles, ranging from the small amount of previous research that's available to comparisons with other jurisdictions. 
and the report culminates in a series of recommendations. Some address the fundamental structure of the guidelines and the deeply embedded broad policy choices that underlie them. Others, other recommendations focus on very specific details of the, of the uh, offense variables and prior record variables. Collectively, they're not only what we believe to be logical responses to the research findings, but they account for the entire context in which Michigan's guidelines evolved and operate. Since not everyone here is familiar with how the guidelines work, I'm going to start with some background information, and I hope that the judges and attorneys among you who are painfully familiar with how they work um, will bear with me for just a couple of minutes. Initially, the guidelines in Michigan were developed by a Supreme Court committee before the legislature ever stepped in. In 1983, uh, the court set up a committee of judges. They operated for a, for a trial period and then were revised in 1988. The purpose of the judicial guidelines was simply to rein in outliers, those sentences that were way above or way below the norms, and to keep sentences within the averages representing similar crimes and similar defendants. The judicial guidelines were advisory, Judges had to explain their reasons for departing from them, but they weren't required to comply with the recommendations. And they didn't apply to habitual offender sentences. In 1994, the legislature established a sentencing commission to develop guidelines, and those were actually enacted, the commission's guidelines, in 1998. The purpose of the legislative guidelines was normative. That is, the commission wasn't just averaging the sentences the judges already imposed, but were deciding for themselves, for itself, how much time a particular combination of offense and defendant characteristics should be worth. Compliance was mandatory. Sentences, as, um, as Kelly pointed out, had to be it was one of those states that had to have, where judge had to have substantial and compelling reasons for departing, either above or below the applicable range. And substantial and compelling meant the reason had to be objective and verifiable. It had to be highly relevant to the purpose of the sentence. And it had to exist only in exceptional cases. And bear that in mind. <laughs> All our data comes before the Michigan guidelines were made advisory in 2015. So when we talk about departure rates, as I will in a minute, um, you know, and the idea that departures should be uh, only in exceptional cases, you know, just keep, keep that thought in the back of your mind. The enabling legislation defined the commission's tasks, uh, in large part as, as Kelly has described them generally, to collect and analyze data, to develop guidelines, to conduct ongoing research about the impact of guidelines, including projected prison impacts, and it was built into the legislation to recommend modifications of the guidelines to the legislature beginning two years after they were enacted and every two years thereafter. So obviously there was this anticipation of an ongoing commission. In addition, the Michigan enabling legislation um, specifically said that the commission should consider offenses involving violence against a person to be more severe than other offenses. Well, that's generally the norm in sentencing, you know, with the exception of the high point of drug offenses, perhaps. Um, but they didn't say specifically increased sentence lengths for assaultive offenses. They also said establish separable offender statute. This meant that the guidelines, the legislative guidelines, unlike the judicial ones, were guidelines, unlike the judicial ones, were to be applied to habitual offender sentences. But they didn't say how different those ranges should be. And as Kelly noted, Michigan, other, other commissions placed some specific priority on certainty in sentencing. Uh, that wasn't explicit in the Michigan guidelines, and uh, as we'll see, it didn't happen. It hasn't happened, as many of you know. So the way the guidelines work, what you've got up here in the slide is the A-grid guideline. You'll also find that on the cover of the report. So when that slide eventually comes down if you want to refer as I'm talking about various grids you can just look down at the report and see. Um, we do have nine grids more than other jurisdictions and our grids aren't based on the nature of the offense. They're based on offense 
uh, on the, the maximum penalty for the offense. So person and property crimes, or very different types of person crimes, can end up on the same grid because they have the same statutory max. And they run from a separate grid for second degree murder. First degree murder, of course, is mandatory life without parole, so that's not subject to the guidelines. But second degree murder has its own grid, and the A grid, uh, which is what's up here, applies to life maximum offenses. And then they go all the way down to the H grid, where the max is jail or another community based sanction. The higher the maximum penalty on the grid, the higher the starting points of the recommended minimum sentence ranges. And, and we've got the prior record level on the horizontal axis and the uh, offense level on the, on the vertical axis on each grid. And individual prior record and offense variables are scored for the offense. The scores are totaled to reach a prior record level and an offense level offense variable level. And the points required for each level appear in the row and column headings of the grid, as you can see. So you have to have zero prior record points to be at prior record level A. Just one point is enough to increase the low end of the cell going, uh, if, if, if you look at it going down, it increases the low end by six months as you move from offense level, variable level one, to by 30 months as you get down to offense level. No, I'm going backwards, sorry. Um, yeah, no, that's right. Um, to, OB, to LB level one. So if you also note on the grid, there's 20 points between each of the OV levels. Bear these in mind as we talk about the scoring of the OVs and how easy it is to get pushed from one offense variable level to the next, offense severity level. Each grid contains a series of cells. Each cell contains a range of months. The A grid has 36 uh, cells. The murder two grid, which is not up, has 18. The months in the cell is the range in which the judge is supposed to select the minimum sentence. But as you can see, let's see if we can make this work. You've got on the diagonal the same the same range of sentences gets repeated. The scoring of the prior record variables and especially the scoring of the offense variables requires judicial fact finding. So for instance, OV7, which is aggravated physical abuse, has 50 points if the victim was treated with sadism, torture, excessive brutality, or conduct designed to substantially increase the victim's fear and anxiety. The choice for the judge is 50 points or none. And the Michigan Supreme Court has upheld awards of 50 points for racking a shotgun during a, a carjacking. Also, 50 points for striking robbery victims in the head with an airsoft gun that looked like a sawed-off shotgun. So that alone, without adding any of the other factors, that 50 points would put someone into offense level, uh, in offense level three. The other uh, offense variables require judges to determine things like the defendant's state of mind, whether the defendant was a leader among co-defendants, whether there was serious psychological injury to a victim's family. These get to be pretty subject subjective. They all, judges are also required to calculate the offense variable score on the highest point allocations possible. They can't say, well, you know, he sort of fits, but I'm going to I'm going to reduce it. I'm going to give somewhat fewer points. The, the directions say maximum number of points uh, available for any given OV have to be scored. So as Kelly explained, we're different from other state jurisdictions where the severity level is determined simply by the statutory offense. An armed robbery is an armed robbery regardless of details unless the statute in another state builds in a detail like making armed robbery with injury a separate crime, for instance. And that's what the defendant was convicted of. But basically, only the prior record and the nature of the offense as defined by statute determine the guidelines range. 
So the guidelines range isn't based, the guidelines range isn't based on any judicial fact finding. Now, judges can find facts that they then use to depart above or below the range, but the guidelines range itself is established simply by those two factors. In Michigan, of course, all this fact finding is done in the context of figuring out what the guidelines range is going to be because it's done in calculating the offense variable scores in particular. This difference in judicial fact finding was critical to the Michigan Supreme Court's decision in 2015 in People v. Lockridge because that decision ultimately, as, as I'll talk about a little, just a little bit later, uh, a little bit more, made our guidelines advisory. They had been mandatory, um, but the U.S. Supreme Court has said that using judicial fact-finding to determine the required minimum sentence violates the right to have a jury decide all facts. So Michigan's scheme that mandated selecting the minimum sentence from cells that were chosen based on judicially found facts violated the Sixth Amendment. The way these cells get utilized is in each cell, there's a minimum, minimum, and a maximum minimum. So right in this corner cell, 21 months would be the low end of the range, and for someone who was not habitualized, 35 months would be the high end, the maximum minimum. And, you know, Michigan practitioners tend to refer to the min-min and the max-min. But remember, as, as Kelly stressed, these are the minimum sentence that's being chosen by the judge here. Uh, the maximum sentence is normally the maximum set by statute for the crime. However, for life maximum offenses in Michigan, which has not revised its penal code in decades, remember, the statutory penalty for the offenses we're looking at is life or any term of years. So when the judge doesn't elect a parolable life, and that doesn't happen very often these days, parolable life sentences aren't that common, it is the judge who's selecting the maximum sentence as well as the minimum. So the judge for a life max offense can say 10 to 20, 25 to 40, 60 to 90, whatever they pick. So the length of that range between the minimum and when the when the defendant would max out the range within which the parole board has discretion is whatever the judge decides. The effect of habitualizing then uh, compounds the breadth of the ranges. If a prosecutor elects to file an habitual offender enhance enhancement, the max min, the high end of the guidelines range, is increased by 25, 50, or 100 percent, depending on whether the defendant is sentenced as a second, third, or fourth offender. So you can see where that 35 months is where there's no habitual, second offender, the max is, the high end of the guidelines range is 43 months, goes up to, I can't even read that from here, 52 months, and then for a fourth habit habitual offender, that cell range, that A1 range, is now 21 to 70. The minimum sentence can be chosen within, any, within that range. So the way to look at these ranges is uh, you've got the, to the left, the large number on the left is the min-min, and the one on the right is the max-min, depending on the habitual status. And then, of course, judges can depart below the low end, the min-min, or above the max-min. Overall, the Sentencing Commission's broad mandate included identifying which cases should never result in prison and in which judges should have the discretion to decide whether to impose a prison sentence. But for the life maximum offenses, which virtually always result in prison terms, the Commission itself focused on three goals. Preserving judicial discretion, increasing sentence lengths, and making prior record at least equal in importance to offense severity. And for each of those goals, we're going to look at the policy choices that were made and how those choices were implemented and what the consequences were. And this, this will necessarily just be an overview. It, it's complicated. But uh, trust me, if you want more details, they're somewhere in here. <laughs> so. 
First, preserving judicial discretion. Achieving this was simple. All you had to do was make the cell ranges wide enough, and judges can make very, very different choices while staying within the guidelines. So on the A grid, with a P, uh, prior record level variable of D, at OV level 6, offense variable 6, am I in the right spot? Right there. Um, the range for a non-habitual is seven years wide. It goes from 171 as the min-min all the way to 285, 285 months as the max-min. On the murder grid, which you don't have before you, the narrowest range for minimums is five years. Ranges of 8, 10, 15 years are common, and the widest in the lower right-hand corner of the murder grid is nearly 20 years. These are hardly substantial constraints on judicial discretion. <laughs> Thanks to attorney Patricia Streeter, who unfortunately couldn't be here today, but who did an enormous amount of very painstaking work, we have eight hypothetical cases in the appendix that compare Michigan scoring to that of six other guidelines jurisdictions. In each case, the Michigan range is far wider than the others. This doesn't necessarily mean that Michigan's average sentences are longer. Sentence length is a different issue that's affected by a lot of factors, but it does mean that other guidelines are designed to reduce disparity by giving judges a much narrower range of choices within which to select a sentence. So as a result of Michigan's ranges, there are enormous differences among cases even when the minimum sentence is within the recommended guidelines range. The next slide looks at where the applicable cell range um, for non-habitual sentences fell. Nearly 45% between the below the min min and above it, above the maximum, nearly 45% aren't even within the range because there are primarily so many downward departures. These are all, this, this graph is all offense types together. So even within these very wide ranges, we see um, we see a spread, a widespread across them, and relatively few, very few uh, sentences, median sentences that are actually at the midpoint of the range, even though when the guidelines were developed, the midpoint was thought to be very important. The results are, are weighted towards the low end because there's a dis disproportionate share of sentences are for armed robbery, and armed robberies are disproportionately downward departures. But when we look at place on the range um, for each type of offense, we still find that the sentences spread from below the low end to well above the high end of the applicable cell. So as we can see, if you look at 233 non-habitual sentences that were imposed for sex offenses where the applicable cell range was 135 to 225 months, that's 11 and a quarter years to 18 and three quarter years, a spread of seven and a half years within the range. And four cells on the A grid have this range. The sentences that resulted went from three and a half years to 65 years. The midpoint of the range was 15, but only 39 sentences, fewer than 17% were right at the midpoint. And even with it, with seven and a half years within which to select a minimum, 19% of the sentences were below the range, and 15% were above it. So, to reiterate, I mean, these are all CSC sentences which were theoretically in identical cell ranges, and that's the spread you get. So despite the legislature's goal of having similar offenses, for, similar sentences for similar defendants who were convicted of similar crimes, we see this enormous variation in sentence length for people who were convicted of the same offense and whose guideline scores put them in, in identical ranges. And as, as Annie will describe in some detail, these disparate outcomes often relate to systemic factors like the county of conviction, the identity of the sentencing judge, whether it was a plea or a trial. And, of course, judges can choose to depart below the low end or above the high end of the range. Both of these slides, this one and the previous one, show that departures, which are essentially a rejection of the guidelines recommendation, 
play a critical role in sentence length and create that much more disparity. The compliance rate for non-habitual sentences under the legislative guidelines on the murder two and a grids together was 55%. A departure rate of 45% means it's not just typical, uh, atypical cases in which departures are occurring. Um, as Kelly said, something's going on when you see departure rates that are that, are that steep. The proportion of downward departures varied from 23% for CSC to 40% for armed robbery. The proportion of upward departures, while quite much lower, varied from 5% to armed robbery to 14% for CSC. Downward departures are rarely appealed. There generally has to be something quite unique about the circumstances for a prosecutor to appeal a below guideline sentence. Upward departures, on the other hand, are appealed by defendants regularly, not surprising. Whether these above guideline sentences are upheld depends in part on the standard of review the appellate courts apply. As I mentioned, the legislature made compliance with the guidelines mandatory by allowing departures only for substantial and compelling reasons. Thus, on appeal, the issue was whether the sentencing judge had a sufficient reason for not selecting a sentence that was within the guidelines. It was guidelines compliance that was being reviewed. But when that portion of the legislation was found un uh, unconstitutional by the Michigan Supreme Court in Lockridge, the court chose the solution of making the guidelines advisory, a minimum that is considered but not mandated doesn't violate the Sixth Amendment. So judges must calculate the scores and consider the recommended ranges, but they don't have to follow them. The appellate court only has to find the sentence chosen was reasonable. To be reasonable, a sentence only has to be proportionate to the crime and the defendant. It doesn't matter how it fits with the guidelines. This more relaxed standard allows for a lot of subjectivity and outcomes that are sometimes hard to reconcile. And we examine the impact of standards of review in Chapter 16. The Commission's second goal with these life maximum offenses was to lengthen sentences. And there's no question that that occurred. The median non-habitual sentence increased by one and a half years, or 23%. The cost of this increase, I think in today's dollars, was 51 million a year, or 720 million for the 14-year study period. The median habitual sentence increased by five years, or 50%. The cost of this increase was 35 million a year, or 486 million over the 14 years. So altogether, in today's dollars, the cost of increasing sentence lengths for life maximum offenses was $1.2 billion over 14 years, from 1999 to 2012, with no evidence, as Josh will tell you, um, that longer sentences actually improve public safety. This slide shows us the median minimum sentence length by habitual status for each offense group. By and large, the most significant increases generally occurred as soon as the defendant's status changed from being a non-habitual to a second offender. Bear in mind as we look at these numbers, these are just the median sentence, meaning if you made a list of 100 of them, half of them would be above the median and half of them would be below. But it doesn't tell you how much above or how much below. Many sentences actually are, are over the median, many are, are under, many are much higher. So these medians are useful for comparisons over time or across groups, but they don't necessarily represent the actual time people are serving. Don't, don't take the median as an indication that, you know, how much people serve on an assault to murder sentence is 11 years. Um, and of course, the habitual sentences are longer in part because they, reckon, they involve people by definition with longer minimum sentences, with longer prior records, I'm sorry. People with higher prior records who weren't habitualized are 
are among the non-habitual group. They may still have long prior records that the prosecutor didn't choose to, to file an enhancement. But by definition, those in the habitual group have longer prior records. But while habitual, uh, so that's, that's part of why they're longer, but the fact that they were habitualized and the range got wider is, is the rest of the story. And while habitual offender sentences were much longer than non-habitual sentences, only about a third of the habitual sentences actually exceeded the standard high end of the applicable range. That is, just because judges could take advantage of broadened ranges for habitual sentences doesn't mean they necessarily did. In fact, more than 10% of the habitual sentences at every level were, at, were below the min-min. Habitual offender sentences that did exceed the standard max min ran the gamut from only slightly above to well above even the 100% increase that was allowed. Um, and not surprisingly, the length of the minimum sentence increases from habitual offenses differed by offense type. Another change that may have resulted from the legislature's decision to apply the guidelines to habitual offenders is that the percentage of sentences with habitual offender enhancements increased by 25%. That is, more people were, are getting habitualized under the legislative guidelines than used to get habitualized under the judicial guidelines. So let's turn now to how these longer sentences were made to happen, regardless of habitual status. First, you increase the starting point of the cells. For example, you take someone being sentenced for armed robbery who is in the highest level for prior record, but the lowest level for offense severity. Under the second judicial guidelines, the range for the minimum sentence was 36 to 120 months. That is, three to 10 years. Under the legislative guidelines, it became 108 to 180 months, between nine and 15. Then you require judges to score the individual aggravating factors instead of, and to, you require them to score the aggravating factors instead of allowing them to decide on a case-by-case -case basis whether these factors justify a departure, as typically occurs in other states. And you require them to always score the maximum, the highest possible points. And you don't score mitigating factors. You design the offense and prior record variables to push people into higher offense severity and, prior, high, and higher prior record levels. Chapter six in the report discusses the scoring of all the OVs and the PRVs in detail. And I'm not gonna do that, but I am gonna give a few highlights that reflect um, important policy choices. Like double counting, for instance, in homicide and assault with intent to murder cases, OV6, offense variable six, scores either 25 or 50 points for the intent to kill. Even though the intent to kill is already a legal element of these offenses, which put them on the higher grids. OV1 scores aggravated use of a weapon when, although not technically a legal element, that behavior is an overwhelmingly common means of committing murder, assault, and armed robbery. Over 61% of armed robbery sentences had 15 points for pointing a gun at or toward a victim or threatening a victim with a knife, although actual or purported possession of a weapon is an element of the offense. So you have to possess it for it to be armed robbery, but if you point it or threaten somebody with it, there's an additional 15 points. Nearly 75% of murder sentences and 80% of assault with intent to murder sentences had 25 points for discharging a firearm at a victim or for cutting or stabbing a victim. OV2 adds further points for the lethal potential of the weapon, scoring 10 points if it was a short-barreled shotgun or rifle, and five if it was a pistol or a rifle or a shotgun. So an armed robbery for which, by definition, the defendant had to be armed, goes on the A grid because it's a life max offense, and then gets 20 points for displaying a gun or a knife. Real offense sentencing is something Kelly already described. It's the policy of awarding points based on the real facts of the crime regardless of what offense the defendant was actually convicted of. 
So, for instance, if our armed robber, who we'll call Sam, pled down to unarmed robbery, he'd still be scored under OV's 1 and 2 for using a gun. OV 12 scores felonious conduct not resulting in conviction that occurred within 24 hours of the sentencing offense. Using the policy of real offense sentencing, the sentence for the conviction offense can be increased based on uncharged conduct or charges that were dismissed in plea negotiations. So, for instance, if Sam hit a clerk and locked her in a back room, he could be charged, in addition to robbery, with kidnapping and assault. If those charges were dismissed in plea, negotia plea negotiations and he just pled to robbery, he would receive 10 points for the two additional crimes. OV13 combines double counting and real offense sentencing. Among other things, it awards 25 points for a pattern of felonious activity involving three or more crimes against a person within a five-year period. It doesn't matter whether the offenses resulted in convictions. The offense for which the defendant is currently being sentenced must be counted, although crimes scored under OV-12 can't be counted. It gets complicated. But for instance, assume that Sam had gotten into a bar fight four years earlier, before the rabbit and been charged with two counts of felonious assault. He hit somebody with a chair or a bottle. Two people. He pled guilty to one count of felonious assault and got probation. The other count was dismissed. It was not a big deal, felony. But added to the current robbery conviction, he would have three offenses against a person in five years and would receive 25 additional points. And again, if you keep your eye on the grid, you can see what the impact is of those 25 additional points and how it helps push you along. Still another example of real offense sentencing is actually a prior record variable. PRV7 awards 20 points for two or more subsequent, subsequent or concurrent felony convictions. If Sam went to trial and was convicted of robbery, kidnapping, and assault, even though all the sentences would be served concurrently, they could all be lengthened based on these additional 20 points. That is, prior record variable 7 allows for punishment for the sentencing offense to be increased on the basis of convictions that would not otherwise count. Overall, 47% of sentences were pushed into at least PRV level 7 based on this single variable. In addition, concurrent and subsequent convictions that are scored in PRV7 can also be scored as part of a continuing pattern of criminal behavior under OV13. So that's how they get double counted. With only 20 points, of separ points separating each of the six offense severity levels on the A grid and 50 points separating the three offense levels on the murder two grid, the offense variable scoring results in people easily reaching the 100-point cutoff for the highest level on either grid. Third, the commission chose to make prior record at least equal in importance to offense severity. And we can see from the way the grids are designed, there is this constant balance being struck between PRV level and OV level. So if one goes up, the other goes down. The cell ranges stay the same. As a result, the murder two grid has 18 cells, but only eight different cell ranges. The A2 grid has 36 cells, but only 11 different ranges. The guidelines create the illusion of precision, but in fact, all these redundant cells yield median sentences that are inconsistent and unpredictable. Over and over again, identical ranges produce widely different median sentences. So we also see Medians, median sentences that are below the mid-min of the cell. Median sentences that are at the mid-min of the cell. Different ranges that have identical min-mins and identical ranges with very different min-mins. I'm sorry, medians. Different ranges with identical medians and identical ranges with very different medians. And in particular, the same ranges result in very different median sentences depending on the offense. So, if a CSC falls in the same range as a robbery, the medians are going to be real different. 
no matter what the cell ranges actually say. The A grid has six cells with a range of 108 to 180 months. These run on the diagonal from um, the A4, from the A6, I'm sorry, down in the corner, up to the F1 in the upper right. This slide shows the median sentences for each of these cells, depending on the type of the offense. So while the offense, each offense starts with a median, again, these are the 108 to 180 month cells. While each offense starts with a median of 120 months in the A6 cell, in the lower left, they exhibit very different patterns as they go along the diagonal towards the F1 in the upper right. You can see the, the CSC, which is the orange, rise, then fall, then rise a lot. The assault medians mostly fall. The robbery medians blip down, then go back up, but then stay completely flat. In the B5 cell, if you look straight up, the difference in median sentences is nearly five years. In the E2 cell, the difference depending on offense is more than seven years. The scoring of the seven prior record variables is designed to move people into higher rec prior record levels with relative ease. There's a decay factor that helps eliminate very old priors. Prior convictions can't be counted if they're more than 10 years, if more than 10 years have elapsed between discharge from that offense and the commission of any subsequent offense. But there's this chaining effect. So that if you were convicted of offense A, 20 years ago, you were discharged from parole nine years ago, but then committed offense B, priors A and B will both be scored when you're sentenced now for offense C. The scoring of prior felonies distinguishes between high severity and low severity felonies, a sensible and common technique, with far fewer points awarded for low severity felonies. For high severity felony, one prior adds 25 points and immediately pushes you into prior record level D. Two priors, two prior high severities, gives you 50 points and pushes you into PRV level E. And three, higher, three priors are 75 points and push you right into level F, regardless of what else your prior record looks like. The trick, however, is how high severity priors are defined. Michigan treats any prior that carries a maximum sentence over five years as high severity. This makes the most common high severity priors possession of meth, delivery of narcotics under 50 grams, assault with intent to commit great bodily harm, breaking and entering into a commercial structure, and uttering and publishing. So these are the high severity felonies that are driving a lot of people into into higher prior record levels. And in scoring the priors, whether high or low, you count multiple convictions from the same incident. So if somebody had three prior convictions because they had three victims in a robbery, or three crimes were committed in the course of one transaction, you stole a car while in possession of drugs and then fled from the police, those are three priors. Since prior record level depends on the total number of points, regardless of how they're accumulated, it is quite possible for a defendant to score into prior record level E without any prior convictions more serious than one with a five-year max. This can result from a combination of low severity felonies, juvenile adjudications, misdemeanors, and the scoring of other factors that aren't even actually priors. In turn, a high prior PRV level then push, can push defendants with relatively low offense severity scores into high guideline cells, adding years to the low end of the recommended range. We already saw how prior record variable seven counts concurrent and even subsequent convictions. Prior record variable five scores misdemeanors. 
any adult misdemeanor or equivalent juvenile adjudication that's an offense against a person or property, a controlled substance, or a weapons offense, or involves operating a vehicle of any kind while under the influence gets scored. One misdemeanor is only two points, but that immediately pushes you into PRV level B. Two misdemeanors is five points. You get up to 20 points for seven misdemeanors. But because of the way old priors get counted, if you had three misdemeanors nine years apart, in 27 years, you'd get 10 points and it'd put you right into level C. PRV6 scores points for the defendant's relationship to the criminal justice system when the sentencing offense was committed. So for instance, if you were on probation for a misdemeanor, here's five points under PRV6. If you were on probation or parole for a felony, that's 10 points. If you were in jail, pre-adjudication or pre-sentencing, and you did something while you were in that amounted to a felony, that's 15 points. If you were in prison, if you were in jail or prison, but you'd already been sentenced, that's 20 points. So, in, in, in effect, serving a jail sentence for a misdemeanor and catching a new uh, conviction is the equivalent of three prior low severity felony convictions. The common thread in OPRV6 is extra punishment for not having been deterred by past punishments. However, every relationship to the criminal justice system already carries its own punishment in the form of parole or probation revocation or consecutive sentencing. These added points are on top of penalties that are built in when you commit an offense while you're in jail or while you're on parole or while you're in prison. So this is another clear example of multiple punishments for the same facts. Take a defendant who's being sentenced for being a prisoner in possession of a cell phone. That in itself has a five-year max. She's going to receive, under PRV6, 20 points for being uh, in prison when the offense was committed. Another 25 points under offense variable 19, which is a threat to the security of a penal institution, which is how cell phones are viewed. And by statute, the, sentence, the new sentence will be consecutive to the one she's already in prison serving. Then there's the ultimate double counting of prior record, which is increasing the high end of the cell range because the prosecution has chosen to file an habitual offender enhancement. The habitual offender statute allows a judge to increase the maximum sentence beyond what is set by the penal code for the conviction offense. So if the statute carries a 20 year max, the judge can actually go above it if somebody's habitualized. If the conviction offense already carries a penalty of life or any term, the habitual offender statute can't make the potential maximum any harsher than life or any term. But by leveraging the defendant's habitual status to raise the guidelines recommendation for the minimum sentence, defendants convicted of life maximum offenses may also have their prison terms lengthened by the prosecutor's decision to pursue habitual offender charges. There's no limit on the age nature, or severity of the prior felonies that can be used to support an habitual offender enhancement. The prior convictions don't even have to arise from separate criminal incidents. The defendant's criminal history is already a key component of the sentencing guidelines. The higher the prior record score, the higher the guidelines range. Why then should that range be expanded based on the very same consideration, the defendant's criminal history? This use of the habitual offender enhancement does not just double count the defendant's prior record in a general way. It has multiple specific consequences. Most apparent, it allows for such enormously long minimum sentences and such enormously wide guidelines ranges that it effectively negates any constraints on judicial discretion in sentencing people as habitual offenders. Equally important, the habitual offense enhancement and the PRV score can count exactly the same prior crimes. That is, the same priors can put the defendant into a higher range in the first place and then be used to raise the high end of that range because, because you've been habitualized. Conversely, the habitual enhancement can be used to increase a minimum sentence based on priors that the sentencing guidelines weigh less heavily or exclude altogether if they're too old, for instance. 
Since filing habitual offender enhancements lie solely in the prosecutor's discretion, widely divergent practices um, occur across counties. And this adds to the disparities in sentencing the guidelines that, to sentencing that the guidelines were meant to reduce. As Kelly's, Kelly's colleagues at the Robina Institute um, have warned us in several of their very thorough publications, criminal history enhancements can have a number of adverse impacts. They can increase the size and expense of the prison population. They can shift the age, composition, and risk level of prison in, as prison inmates uh, who are older and nonviolent individuals tend to have longer criminal histories. So if they're habitualized, you've got a population that's older and nonviolent. They can undercut the, the goal of using limited prison beds for people who are actually convicted of violent offenses. They can decrease the proportionality of sentence severity relative to offense severity. So the more you put emphasis on prior record by habitualizing people, the more weight you're giving to prior record, the less the sentence depends on the seriousness of the offense itself. And finally, and importantly, they can increase racial disparity in prison populations because non-white defendants have larger criminal history scores than whites. Thus, as Annie will explain, there's very little evidence of overt racial discrimination at the sentencing stage itself. But the myriad factors within and outside of the criminal justice system lead to non-white defendants having more juvenile adjudications and more felony convictions, and that results in larger prior record scores. These, in turn, contribute to the massive imbalance of black and brown people in our prisons. To summarize, which I really am right now, in adopting the Sentencing Commission's guidelines, the legislature made numerous critical choices. It opted to group offenses on grids by their statutory maximum sentences instead of by the similarity of the defendant's conduct, although judges and prosecutors generally think about crimes by the nature and extent of the harm they cause. It included numerous redundant cells in an attempt to balance the weight given to prior record and offense severity scores. It made the ranges on the grids that apply to life maximum offenses extremely broad in order to preserve judicial discretion. It designed prior record and offense severity variables that double count aspects of the conviction offense and of the defendant's criminal history, that score behavior that was not part of the conviction offense, and that purposefully, purposefully enhanced sentence lengths for murder, assault, and CSC cases. It incorporated numerous aggravating factors into guidelines variables, then required judges to award the maximum number of points available for those factors. It declined to incorporate mitigating factors into the variables. It extended the high end of the guidelines range for second, third, and fourth habitual offender sentences by 25, 50, and 100 percent. And it made compliance with the guidelines mandatory but permitted departures for substantial and compelling reasons. It was expected that the commission would have the opportunity to assess the impact of these choices and to recommend changes as needed to better achieve the guidelines goals. Because the commission was abolished, that assessment never occurred. While the analyses in these chapters are no substitute for a systematic review by a multi-stakeholder, professionally staffed commission, the evidence we've examined suggests several conclusions. The guidelines don't compel extremely long sentences, but they allow and encourage them. Judges routinely imposed minimum sentences at or below the low end of the ranges, especially in armed robbery cases, even when the defendant had received a habitual enhancement. Judges and prosecutors often behaved as if they felt the guidelines recommendations were inappropriately harsh. However, Judges also commonly imposed minimum terms of 25 or more years, especially on those convicted of murder, sex offenses, and as habitual offenders, while staying in compliance with the guidelines. The extent of departures from the recommended ranges suggests that judges were frequently dissatisfied with the options they were given. The complexity of the guidelines creates the appearance of precision while preserving enormous discretion for judges and enhancing the ability of prosecutors to achieve outcomes they desire. The guidelines not only fail to reduce disparity, they promote it. Thank you for your patience.
intro to move on to the research design and finding session and to introduce Dr. Uh, Ann Maher. Ann was the research specialist at Safe and Just Michigan from 2019 to 2021. She previously was an assistant prof professor in the Department of Sociology, Anthropology, and Criminal Justice at Arcadia University. She received her BS and MA in Criminal Justice and Criminology from Eastern Michigan and her PhD from Old Dominion University. Currently, she is a departmental and analyst with the Michigan Crime Incident Reporting Unit. Thank you, Ann. So I am going to do my best to get us back on track time-wise because I do not want to stand between you guys and lunch, especially to make me listen to make you guys listen to me talk about numbers, research, and statistics. All right. I, I can read a room. I know that's probably not going to, you know, delay your hunger pains. So um as Jonathan said, I'm Ann Mahar and I did most of the data analysis component um, to what Barb presented. So as Barb mentioned, there was not a lot of research done evaluating the Michigan Sentencing Guidelines um, before right, our project. There were four major research things, and we used those as a starting point of what we were going to build on. Um, and these are some of the things that are unique contributions of what we did. So first, and arguably what I'm going to say is probably one of the most important, is the offense breakdown. So a lot of prior research looked at all A-grade offenses together um, and then right, kind of made comparisons. And we'll talk about in our regression analyses how looking at all of them together masks a lot of important differences when we break them down by specific offense. Thanks, Josh. <laughs> We have a much larger sample size. Um, we dove into, and as Barb talked about a little bit, we examined every single PRV and OV and how many people have that, how that impacts sentences. I will not go over all of those things, but they are in there. Um, county level analyses, we looked at 13 specific counties, uh, and I'll talk about those in a minute. And we also did a deeper dive into... Um, what sentences were habitualized and the impact of that habitualization. So in order to do this research, we had a lot of data. Um, so there was two data sets covering three guidelines periods. Um, we looked at the four most common life max offenses, as Barb had mentioned. So second degree murder, assault with intent to commit murder, first degree CSC, and armed robbery. Um, and we looked at 13 specific counties. So the 13 counties that were chosen for the research uh, were the 13 counties that had the largest number of commitments for assault of offenses in 2013. Because if you'll remember, our data collection ended at 2012. So another thing that's kind of unique about our research is that unit of analysis is the sentence, um, not an individual. So there are multiple individuals are represented in our data multiple times because we looked at sentence as our unit of analysis. Um, we only included sentences that had a minimum and maximum term. So we removed the life with parole sentences for most of our data analysis because it's difficult to kind of quantify those in the same way that we can with uh, sentences that have minimums and maximums. The other thing that we did was remove redundant sentences. So if someone had the exact same sentence for the exact same offense in the same county on the same day, that was excluded. But any of those things change, um, they would be included. So if it's the exact same offense, uh, two different counties, both of those sentences are included in our data. Um, Right, so same statutory citation, all of those things. So we removed the redundant sentences um, in order to not artificially skew our results. Next one, okay, good. So for methods of analysis, um, we did a lot of different things. Most of what I'm going to be talking about is our multivariate analyses, so our multiple regression, so the kind of more advanced statistic components. Um, Barb mentioned some of our univariate analysis, so our ideas of using the median, right? So there's 
reasons we use the median. Um, essentially, most of the Michigan sentencing data is skewed. Um, so, as you can see in the image, we went with the median of eight because, right, that's where most of the data is. Um, but the mean is 10.3 because we have those outlier cases all the way out there at 60 years, right? So that is making sentences look like they're longer than is necessarily true for the vast majority. So skewed average. So as Barb kind of mentioned, um, we use the medians as kind of a guidepost so then we could make comparisons between different counties, the different offenses and sentence length, but it is not always, right, don't take it as everyone who has this offense is serving this sentence, right? We're just kind of using it as a guidepost for comparisons. Okay. So in cleaning the data, so primarily taking out those redundant sentences and the life with parole sentences, we found a couple of things, um, right, before we get into like our real findings. So the number of sentences per defendant increased uh, over time. So this varied a lot by offense, county, and habitual status. So um, among the sentences, I totally just lost where I was. Uh, among the sentences without habitual offender enhancements, um, only 81 or 81% had only one sentence during the second judicial period, and that moved down to 74% under the legislative guidelines. So as we move these guideline periods, we see multiple sentences becoming more of a practice and more common. Um, this is even more so true for uh, habituals, and depending on what offense someone is being sentenced for, um, CSC offenses are the most common to have multiple sentences for the same offense. Um, this also varied by county, but I will get to counties at the end in interest of not giving you entirely too much information on every single slide. So the other thing that we kind of discovered and wanted to at least note um, is that the number of parolable life sentences has declined um, as the number of long indeterminates or lid sentences has increased. So in 1993, we saw a peak um, in the parolable life sentences imposed. Um, and then after between 2007 and 2012, uh, the number is never more than 17. So we saw a really stark decrease in the number of life with parole sentences. So. This is a really ugly chart, and it's for a reason. Okay, so what explains sentence length? Short answer is a whole lot of stuff, and not of it, all of it is great or perfect, right? But we're, we're going to break it down. So um, we, can, we did regression analyses um, focusing on two primary functions. So first, in a regression analysis, you can identify how much a specific independent variable explains in the variance, so for us, sentence length. Um, and the other thing that we use regression analyses for is to estimate how large of an impact that is. So Barb and I talked a lot about regression analyses, and the way that I always feel like it's best explained is from baking a cake, right? So when you bake a cake, you only put in a pinch of salt, right? So it makes up very, very small amount of the total ingredients, but if you miss that salt, you're gonna notice, right? Your cake is not gonna taste the same. So it makes up a very small amount of the ingredients, but it has a really big impact on the flavor. No bakers? Okay. So if we look at our four main guidelines factors, um, ideally what is going to explain the most of our sentencing variation, we explain 70.9%. Um, so if we look at just what offense was committed, the prior record score, the offense score, and the habitual status, we explain over 70% of our variation in sentence length. Um, so like I said, we did multiple different kinds of analyses in order to break this down in different ways. So overall, looking at second degree murder, assault with intent, CSC, 
and armed robbery, we explain 70%. But when we break those down into separate offenses, that change is pretty big. So our four guidelines factors only explains 29% of the variation in murder sentences, um, up to almost 70% of armed robbery sentences. So when we look at right, all of the sentences together, it looks right, like we're doing pretty good. Uh, but then when we break it down by offense, we can see in more detail that things aren't adding up quite probably as we would hope. So in looking at all of the offenses together, uh, the most important factor is what offense was committed, explaining over a quarter of sentence variation. So this makes sense, right? M2 has its own grid, um, obviously, right? Calculated on a separate grid to reflect the unique seriousness of the crime. And these sentences are always by far the longest. Armed robbery is consistently viewed as the least serious of the four crimes that we examined. Um, and consistently, right, these sentences are much lower for those offenses. So, um, Obviously, we can't break that down by offense because that's already taken into account when we do the offense breakdown. But this suggests two things. So murder is inherently different um, and is evidenced by right, having its own grid and right, sentences being so much longer on that grid. Offense variable. I really thought I fixed that. My bad, guys. So offense variable. Um, Right, so your OB score explains about 20% when looking at the entire right offenses together. Um, this differs greatly by what offense. So the offense severity only explains about 5% of the differences we see in murder sentences um, and about 29% for the other three offenses. So having much more importance in our A grid offenses and Right, second degree murder, kind of in a league of its own, not being explained very much by the severity of the offense. The fact that it was a second degree murder is really what's driving that sentence length there. Um, so breaking down these uh, offenses allow us to examine some specific differences that are overshadowed in the full model. Right, So the fact that if we look at it all together, it looks like 20%, but really it's explaining a very small amount um, in M2 sentences. So prior record variable, um, pretty close, right? So OV was 19%, PRV 23%, right? And Barb mentioned that idea of keeping prior record and offense Severity, or if you're looking at me like no, <laughs> keeping them right kind of balanced, right? The importance of having them be equal to each other. So in the full model, we see that kind of working out and them having a similar explanatory power in the regression analyses. Um, so the extent to the variance, of course, uh, explained by prior record variable ranged again. So it explained 20% of variance in murder sentences, but almost 36% of the difference we see in armed robbery sentences. So being much more important in armed robbery than in the other offenses. Habitual status arguably is uh, the salt of the cake batter, right? So it looks like not very much is explained here, only 2.6%. Um, however, when looking at individual sentences, habitual status does have a very large impact. Uh, the other thing to note about the impact of habitual status is that it had to kind of do with the order that we put our ingredients in our regression because it's so highly cor correlated with prior record variable. Like Barb mentioned, a lot of the things in prior record variable are also counted in habitual status. So if we rearranged it, so we looked at uh, habitual status first before we looked at prior record variable, it would actually explain 15% of the variance and it would take away from how much prior record explains. Um, all that to say that habitual status is important even if in this graphic it doesn't look as important. So taking these right guideline factors together, we're at that 70.9%. Um, and right, 
the guidelines were supposed to explain all of the sentence length. So we still got 30% out there um, that is not explained by the guidelines factors. Departures, uh, as Barb had mentioned, are a very large and important factor in sentence lengths for Michigan. Um, so departures, which are essentially a rejection of the guidelines, play a critical role. So explaining almost 18% in sentence length, looking at all of them together. Um, Brings our cumulative to almost 90%, uh, which in the social science world, if you can explain 90% of something, that is like such a huge win. Um, but for sentencing guidelines, not, not, not so much, right? We want to explain all of the variation we see in sentence length, and we still got 10% hanging out that we can't explain. Um, departures, when we look at the offenses broken down, um, they play a much larger role in second degree murder. So in second degree murder, departures explain over 50% of the variance we see in sentence lengths. So, right, putting all of these together, we're kind of masking that idea. Um, as were for the other offenses, for CSC, it explains 30% of the variance in armed robbery, 26, and assault, 20%. So when we examine the variance, This is why I don't actually make notes, because then I read them, and then I forget what I'm saying. So I'm going to keep going with what I usually do. Okay, so, sorry. Systemic factors. Um, so these are the factors that are always going to kind of be involved in the process and system of sentencing, um, but theoretically don't necessarily have a huge role. So conviction method, um, explaining less than one half of a percent. County of conviction. Um, less than one-tenth of a percent, but these are similar to the idea of habitual status, but in this picture, they don't look like they make a very big difference. Um, however, when we start looking at the size of the impact of these different variables, um, county of conviction, and especially conviction method, can have very large impacts on the sentences that people actually end up receiving. Um, Barb also did a little bit of research on sentencing judge. We didn't have enough data on sentencing judge to include that in the regression analyses, but essentially one of the main things that we found is that judges in the very same county impose significantly different sentences for the same offense type. So in the county, same county, same bench, same offense, very different sentences depending on if you were in courtroom A or courtroom B and who your judge was that day. Defendant characteristics um, wasn't even statistically significant in most of our analyses, which is, which is a good thing, right? We, those should not be impacting our sentence length. So um, what we found was that women generally received shorter sentences. Um, they made up a relatively small portion of our population. So Women accounted for almost 11% of murder sentences, but less than 5% for every other kind of offense. Um, women's sentences were always shorter, and this is largely due to uh, women having much lower prior records than their male counterparts and having a higher proportion of guilty pleas. Um, age generally, as one might expect. We saw a sentence length increase with age, right? As you are older, you have more time to kind of accumulate that prior record. Um, the exception to this is consistently we found that juveniles under 17 who had been waived into the jurisdiction of adult court received longer sentences than youth who were just 17 and had to be in the adult court. So there was a difference in those prior records of those juveniles. So, as Barb kind of had mentioned, um, race plays a really complex role when looking at sentencing. Um, it's not, in, separately, it does not play a significant portion or explain a significant portion in sentencing length. Um, however, it has a lot of indirect kind of relationships, right? So, um, specifically, we looked at prior record and also worth noting that our sample um, was very skewed to non-white. So 
non-whites comprised 74% of our sample, right, for these four offenses in this time period. Um, and, right, the non-whites are overrepresented for each offense um, except for CSCs, which non-whites comprised only 44% of our population. So when we look at sentence length, we generally see that those who are non-white do have longer sentences, but right, it is explained by other factors. It is not race per se at the sentencing stage. It's all those kind of earlier decisions that were made specifically related to prior record. So the impact of these factors on sentence length. So we know how much of the sentence they explain, but right, this part is how much of an impact does it actually have. So this is the other part of regression analyses where we can estimate how our baseline sentences will change if particular variables are adjusted. Um, and there's a, quite a few tables that are pretty involved if you feel so possessed to go and kind of like do the math of how long sentences would be. There is kind of like one breakdown example in there. Um, but if you have questions, I'm more than happy to talk about that. Um, so that was the other kind of major thing that we looked at is how these different factors impact sentence length. So in the full model, um, an increase from PRV level A to PRV level C was associated with an estimated increase of 73% in sentence length. So right, goes up about three quarters just from level A to level C. Um, PRV level had the least impact in M2 sentences. Um, then, right, in OV level, we see something kind of similar that from OV level one to OV level three, we see a 78% increase. Um, and then, right, when we look at the lowest level, moving up to the highest level, we see the sentences increase almost, right, three times. OV level had the most impact on sentences for CSC offenses. Again, uh, in the full model, looking at departures, um, if a sentence was a downward departure, instead of being within the guidelines range, we estimated a 44% de decrease in sentence length and Right, looking at increase or upward departures, we saw a 76% increase in sentence length. Um, this, again, varied with what offense we were looking at. So the lowest decrease was 43% for downward departures for robbery sentences and an 82% increase for upward departures, specifically for CSC offenses. So conviction method. Um, we could probably do a whole presentation on conviction method alone, but I will not do that to you. Um, but essentially, our big takeaway is that the guidelines reinforce disparities that are created by plea bargaining. So um, in the graph, we can see that second degree murder. Um, the first column is the median sentence if someone were to plea. The Second column is if they were to go to a bench trial. And the third column is the median sentence if they go to a jury trial. And then there's the percent increase, which is often called the trial tax. Um, there's plenty of debate on if the trial tax is the tax or if pleading, you get a benefit. Uh, but essentially, the real takeaway here is people are getting very different sentences for the exact same offense. Same PRV, same OV, right? Same facts, but depending on if they're going to jury or trot, going to a jury trial or plea, right? They're getting very different sentences. Um, this had a significant impact on um, our life max offenses and what sentences they received. But it kind of, I think, an important note. Um, most of us are probably familiar with the idea that most offenses are dealt with by plea, right? When I used to teach, we would say 95% of all cases are dealt with by plea. Um, that is not entirely true when looking at these offenses. So when looking at life max offenses, um, it's only 80% were 
yes, 80% for life maximum offenses are dealt with by police. So we see a lot more of these offenses going to trial um, compared to their kind of less serious counterparts. So the impact in the end of this as an independent variable didn't appear to contribute much to uh, sentence length, but they're more pronounced here. So in the full model, if the conviction method was a bench or jury trial, we estimate that the sentence would be 6% longer for a bench trial or 18% longer if the person decided to go to a jury trial um, compared to a plea. Um, also worth noting is between the two time periods, so going from leg judicial guidelines to legislative guidelines, we saw a big change in who decided to go to trial, who decided to take a plea, and what the size of those impacts were also. Um, looking at offense-specific... Looking at a specific offense specific, again, right, we see a difference in how much of an impact this has. So while the amount of increase varied by offense, um, ranging from 12% longer sentences um, in the regression analyses, not here for murder sentences, um, but if the assault of the sentence was for assault, we saw sentences increase 20%. So while it Explain less than half of a percent of all of the variation has a substantial impact on what people's sentences actually end up being. Okay. And then all of the things that I just said then can be explained another 13 different ways when we look at the counties, right? So all of those analyses we did, we did then by each individual county. Um, it was a lot. So... Right. Essentially, the big tagline there is defendants with similar backgrounds, um, similar offenses, received very different sentences uh, depending on what county they were convicted in. And every single thing that I just discussed about how it varied by offense, it then also varied by county. So how, mu how important a prior record variable is in one county versus the next um, is pretty different. So, for example, in Wayne County, uh, prior record explained only 17% of the variance in sentences, while in Muskegon, it explained almost 36% of how long sentences ended up being. So, we see very big differences in counties of how they're weighing these things and then also how they end up impacting sentence length. So, right, obviously, I'm not going to do that for another 13 regression analyses because. I think you guys want to eat here eventually, but, right, like Barb said, it's all in the report. Um, so the impact of these guidelines or these factors also varied by county. Um, so, for example, PRV in Genesee, a sentence length increased by 23% if it was PRV level A to PRV level B. Um, however, in Kalamazoo, that same increase, incre right, from level A to level B, increase your sentence 57%. So all of these things, right, kind of wash out to be very different sentences depending on what county you are sentenced in. Conviction method um, also, right, varied by county. So the idea of adding a jury trial tax added 11% to your sentence in Ingham, 12% in Wayne, um, and then in other counties, going to trial added 25 to 30% increase in your sentence um, in Calhoun. Right, So entirely just depending on what county you're in, um, seeing very different sentence lengths based on these kind of same decisions. Departures also played a really big role that we saw a lot of different different impacts depending on what county. Um, so in Wayne and Genesee, departures explained about 22% of the variance. And then we had other counties that really stuck closely to the sentencing guidelines. Um, 
such as Oakland, Kalamazoo, Washtenaw, that departures only explain about 5 to 10 percent. So again, really big disparities depending on what counties you're looking at and what variables. Okay. So the last bit that I will talk about is habitualization. Um, so the use bless you, of habitual offender enhancements vary significantly by county. Um, not only how often it is used, but the size of that impact also varies. Um, so essentially, we just have this table of what sentence had the enhancement applied and what didn't. Um, in order to determine habitual eligible, we looked at who was habitualized, what sentence were habitualized, included those, and any sentences that had a prior record score for PRV level one or two. It's worth noting that this is an underestimate, right? Because there are plenty of priors that are not included in your PRV score. So actually when we looked at this, we had a handful of people who had a PRV level A, right? So they had no priors scored under the guidelines, but they had still been habitualized. So we know that this is an undercount of who's actually eligible to be um, to have their sentences enhanced with the habitual status. So um, the percentage of eligible sentences that actually receive enhancements varied from a low of just 13% of eligible sentences in Wayne County to 91.7% of eligible sentences in Muskegon and Saginaw counties. So we see this kind of division of who applies it a lot and who rarely applies it. Um, generally, kind of what we found is the counties that are using it a lot are not using it as harshly as others. So, for example, Oakland County habitualizes most sentences that are eligible, but they actually have the smallest impact, right? Their sentences for habituals are at the lower end when we look at these counties together. Um, however, the counties that use it rarely such as Wayne County, um, when they use it, it really impacts the sentence, right? So they kind of reserve it for the more serious things. And then, right, when they have the ability and decide to use that uh, habitual enhancement, they really right, give it to it. So we see these kind of big differences in how it is applied, as well as how much of an impact it has. So, like I said, Oakland utilized the enhancement often, but had the smallest increases in sentence lengths, um, which, right, some of the things that we found through our analyses went against, right, kind of some commonly preconceived notions of Oakland having this, you know, um, tough on crime, harsh kind of um, reputation. That's not necessarily, right, always what our analyses have found. So there's a lot more but I did want to leave at least a few minutes for questions. Um, does anybody have any questions? Yeah. So we do, we did break it down further in the report. So we did look at conviction method if, and we did see quite a few people sentences that um, were pled to and still had the habitual enhancement, but I want to say more than 50% actually, but even for, but that is a very big part of it, right? Uh, substantially more of the habitualized sentences were dealt with by jury trial. So it was part of it, but we were surprised by how many sentences were, were pled and still had that enhancement. Yeah. Does it reflect the actual imposition of sentences enhanced? And, and I'm, I'm gonna, I practice a lot in Oakland County. And up until last year, when we got a new elected prosecutor, the policy was if you were eligible for an enhancement, a notice of enhancement was filed, regardless of the age of the priors or anything else, okay? Mm -hmm. And of course, the whole definition of what qualifies as enhancement in Michigan is so skewed because it does not reflect conviction, sentence, new crime. It can arise out of your first conviction for seven felonies 
in one case. Okay, you are now a HAB 8 if you do something else. Uh, what I found in Oakland County is while the judges would nod their heads and say, yes, okay, you're as a habitual offender, you're going to be sentenced too, but they would impose the exact same sentence as, as their uh, not-so-passive, aggressive way of reacting to the elected prosecutor's policies. So that's my question, is does it really reflect increased sentences under habitual, or is it just the fact that the habitual enhancement was authorized and was part of the case, and maybe a sentence was imposed, but it doesn't reflect an actual increase in sentencing, or does it? So in Oakland County, which was unique, as you might know. Yes, um, <laughs> yes. welcome it, to Oakland County. Yes. Right, so they use it all the time, but we saw the smallest impact of that increase. Okay. So Thank everybody you. was habitualized, but they had the lowest sentences for habit, like the lowest increase in sentences because of habitualization. Saginaw, yeah. Yes, yes, there, there is a very wide variety of how this plays out. Um, we tried to kind of come up with a categorization of like who habitualizes a lot and what the impact is. And essentially, um, it's a little bit like throwing spaghetti at a wall. It's all over the place. There's not a whole lot of rhyme or reason, right? All the counties kind of do it their own way. Okay, I believe it is lunchtime. Thank you. Good lunch break. We are back more or less on schedule. And I'll next. And so far, it's uh, uh, thanks to everybody. Thanks again to the folks who put together the research report and project. It's uh, um, it's, it's it's been very valuable to contextualize what we see in court with just the sheer numbers of the inconsistencies and how many variabilities a system is creating that actually was put together for consistency. It's been uh, remarkable to learn that and hopefully something that can be the impetus for real change. Our next session is on the relationship of long sentences to correction resources and recidivism. And uh, standing next to me is Mr. Josh Ho, formerly incarcerated. Mr. Ho currently works as a full-time policy analyst at Safe and Just Michigan and has also worked as a social media and messaging consultant. He's the host and creator of, Decar of the Decarceration Nation podcast and episode 120 that just uh, had episode 120. So for folks who do not have not listened to it yet, please uh, uh, add it to your, your queue and, and start listening. Josh has a background in public speaking, debate, and public policy research. Mr. Ho, thank you. Uh, hi. As was just said, my name is Josh Ho. I'm a policy analyst at Safe and Just Michigan. Uh, the bad news, there's good news, bad news proposition. The bad news is this is probably my least favorite kind of speaking. Generally, what I like to do is extemporaneous speaking that involves me walking around the room and waving my arms around a lot. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't write this report, so it's not intuitive to me in the same way that some other topics would be. So I did a prepared speech, and so I'll be doing a lot of reading. I don't have a, you know, a, 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 a PowerPoint or any of that stuff. But the good news is I will not be talking about the grids at all. So you got that going for you. Um, so I don't know how many of you, like me, were around for the 1970s. Hopefully, uh, not too many of you. Um, you know, there were, there's been a lot of differences from the 70s to now. You know, I was trying to think of things. And, you know, I grew up in New York City. And one of the things I, I thought of that was a major difference was that when I was a kid, if you went to uh, Times Square, it uh, was not necessarily a good thing in the 70s. And now it's pretty family friendly. So that was a big change. You know, uh, I, I guess, uh, you know, when I was a kid, we had rotary phones and now we got the smartphones. So I think that's probably a, a relatively good change. Although, you know, I, I kind of am nostalgic for the time where I didn't have to think about where my phone was at all times. Um, but, you know, there have also been some not so good changes since the 70s. 
Uh, for instance, starting in the 1970s, we started a national bipartisan experiment committed to putting a lot more people in our prisons and jails. As the Brennan Center put it, incarceration grew both at the federal and state level, but most of the growth was in the states, which housed the vast majority of the nation's prisoners. The number of prisoners grew in every state, blue, red, urban, and rural. I remember when I was a kid, people actually firmly believed that people who committed a crime were and should be getting rehabilitation, and then when they got back from incarceration, that they had served their debt to society. Somehow, over the ensuing decades, we became committed to a much harsher view of prison, where you actually often see people celebrating and cheering for violence in our prisons, and to a mindset of locking people up and throwing away the key. And now at the state level, our prison populations are increasingly made up of people with long and indeterminate sentences. This was certainly true in Michigan and continues here today. In the 1970s, less than 5% of people sentenced for second-degree murder, first-degree criminal sexual conduct, and armed robbery had minimums, minimums greater than 20 years. Today, that number is often as many as 15 times greater. We could probably spend hours talking about why this happened. We've had over 30 years of tough-on-crime television and movies. We have media that largely programs and churns out column inches using the mantra, if it bleeds, it leads. And way too often, we tend to legislate from anecdotes as opposed to data. But there is also a deep-seated belief that long sentences are just desserts. Many people believe that when someone has done serious harm, they should do substantial time. This report is certainly not trying to suggest that those people are necessarily wrong, but I do think it is important to note that what does seem to have changed since the 1970s is our perception of what substantial time means. Where in the 1970s, people thought that a 10 or 20 year sentence was significant, now we see sentences of 40, 50, 60, or even hundreds of years. In fact, over 40% of the current population of people incarcerated in Michigan's prisons are serving a sentence of over 10 years, when in 1993, the number of incarcerated people serving this kind of sentence was 21%. And today, around 20% of Michigan's population of incarcerated people is serving a term of over 25 years or of life, while internationally, the 44 countries whose data is reported by the Council of Europe suggests that only 1.5% of their incarcerated populations were serving a sentence of over 20 years. Michigan might be in step with this unfortunate national trend, but that trend itself is out of step with history and out of step with the rest of the world. This change in thinking about crime and sentencing over the past decades has probably also had other effects. For instance, crime has largely become disaggregated from prison sentences. As crime has generally decreased over the last decades, our prison population has largely stayed the same. And yes, lately, Michigan's prison population has declined. But if what we've been doing is clearing out what has been called the low-hanging fruit of people with shorter sentences, this has happened while our sentencing practices have pushed for more severity, the result will largely be larger, longer, and more aging prison populations. It is also very useful to look again at these recent declines through a historical lens. In 1993, our prison population was 38,942, and in 2017, our prison population was 39,666. And perhaps most, most, perhaps most interesting, during that same period, index crimes plummeted by more than 56%. Again, there could be many causes for this but I suspect it has something to do with how people who have not been directly impacted by crime perceive stories about crime as opposed to how they personally experienced crime. But that, again, is beyond the scope of this report. At the end of the day, crime has largely been in decline, with the exception of a homicide and domestic violence spike through the pandemic period, while long sentences and incarceration have continued to increase. Okay, so where does this leave us? Well, as was mentioned at the top of this thing, I am formally incarcerated. I'm a formally incarcerated person. So I can speak to some of this with a great deal of firsthand experience and with some authority. 
And if you ask any formerly incarcerated person, and there are several in the room, who they are most worried about in our prisons, it is almost never the people who are doing long sentences. In fact, in most prisons in Michigan, the folks doing life sentences are leaders and often represent the glue keeping down violence in our prisons. Generally, in my experience, the most violent prisons in Michigan are level one prisons and not the higher level prisons. This accords with decades of evidence that suggests both that people who commit serious crimes have very low recidivism rates and also with decades of evidence that suggests that crime is a young person's game and that people generally age out of crime. Sonia Starr and J.J. Prescott, two researchers, put out a study a few years ago which used Michigan data and suggested that people who are over 50 and served at least five years have an active recidivism rate of less than 1%. They also concluded that policies that seek to shrink the expansive prison population while ignoring prisoners who have committed violent offenses will fail to address the cause of the problem. Ultimately, as these numbers continue to increase, any hope of reform will have to center around people whose crimes are considered violent or serious if we want to have any hope of meaningful reductions in our prison population. As criminologist, economist, and law professor John Pfaff put it in his book Locked In, any significant reduction in U.S. prison population is going to require states and counties to rethink how they punish people convicted of violent crimes, where rethink means think about how to punish less. We will need to move away from pretrial prison classification and parole decisions without using the violent label, and we'll have to shorten prison sentences and lengths of stay for people convicted of violent offenses. We will have to consider changing our sentencing guidelines and investing in back-end reforms like prosecutor-initiated second look or more general second look legislation. You might have heard, me, or have heard me just say that and ask, why do we need to change these things? Well, obviously, the first reason is the human cost. I have a lot of friends who did long sentences and have come back to their communities and become important and valuable members of those communities. I often tell the story of my friend who, after just a few years of being resentenced and released from a juvenile life without parole sentence, was opening warming centers in his neighborhood during the polar vortex. People change, and over decades of time, that change is almost inevitable. One of my friends, a Vietnam veteran who came back after doing 40 years in prison, was so impactful in his community that he was elected a bishop's committee member of his church after one year home. But unfortunately, due to years of poor health care when he was inside, he went mostly blind just a year after release. This is someone I'm very close to, and I often wonder if his sight might have been saved just by letting him out to get good medical care a few years earlier. There is also a net widening problem. As we have become more committed to ensuring that serious crimes get treated with ever-increasing consequences, we have started to label more and more crimes as violent crimes, as serious crimes, as habitual crimes, and even as serious misdemeanors in order to ensure that more and more people get longer and longer sentences. And this net widening has real impacts on the respect for the law. For all the talk of the Ferguson effect, there is also the very real possibility that has been borne out in research that the different standards by which we judge violence has real implications on how people perceive the credibility of our legal system. As law professor David Sklansky, sorry, David Sklansky explained in his recent book, A Pattern of Violence, the common distinction between violent and nonviolent acts played virtually no role in criminal law before the latter half of the 20th century. Yet to this day, with more crimes than ever called violent, the distinction determines how we judge the seriousness of an offense, as well as the perpetrator's debt and danger to society. Similarly, criminal law today treats violence as a pathology of individual character, but in other areas of law, including the procedural law that covers police conduct, the situational conduct of violence carries more weight. The result of these inconsistencies and of society's unique fear of violence since the 1960s has been an application of law that reinforces inequities of race and class, undermining the law's legitimacy. I think we've seen this throughout the country over the last few years. There are also massive monetary costs. The cost, for instance, of incarcerating just one person convicted of armed robbery 
has grown over the last decades by $124,000. That's just for one person. Lengthening the average sentence of 100 people in prison for armed robbery cost taxpayers over $12 million. According to the House Fiscal Agency, over the 15-year period from 2006 to 2020, per prisoner costs for health care increased by an average of 7% annually, and almost certainly the largest driver of that cost was people doing long and indeterminate sentences. And if you look at any budget breakdowns, almost always the largest cost of incarceration is health care costs these days. We have very crowded prisons. We have an aging prison population. And in this time of the pandemic, we have staffing shortages and a lot of people needing, a lot more people needing health care. And obviously there are public safety costs. When Jennifer Granholm doubled the number of people paroled in 2009, the data shows that over 99% of these folks who were paroled never returned to prison. We also tend to believe that prisons are a solution to crime. There have been no, numerous studies, including a very good meta-analysis by Rudman of the Open Philanthropy Project that concluded that prison is no panacea. The best estimate of the marginal impact of incarceration on crime in the U.S. today is zero. The claims that incar increasing the severity of incarceration even mildly deters appear weak. After effects appear to cancel out incapacitation in most contexts. Mueller-Smith's formidable study does str uh, goes strongly the other way. After effects do not merely cancel out incapacitation, but easily surpass it in magnitude, and most likely deterrence as well, so that incarceration increases crime at the margin. Meanwhile, all of the studies reviewed probably leave out most of the crime increases in prison that comes from putting more people there. And I want to talk about that for a second, because not only have I experienced that firsthand, but it is something we almost never talk about. Prisons generate violence inside. Many people are subject to violence and trauma on a regular basis, and some people even die. In fact, over 150 people, mostly people with long and indeterminate sentences, have died in Michigan prisons just over the last two years as the result of the pandemic. One has to wonder, how many of these 150 human beings remained a real public safety risk and how many people in their communities, their parents, their kids, their friends, their partners, mourn their loss every single day? Was it really necessary to keep all these people inside for such long sentences? As Dr. Homer Venters talked about in his book, Life and Death in Rikers Island, incarceration harms health in the United States. We have become the world's most voracious jailers. Without truly understanding how the places where we send people increase their risk for death and serious injury, we blame the incarcerated for whatever might happen to them behind bars. And many of the people we are leaving behind bars were themselves traumatized by crime. People's stories are often much more complicated and nuanced than the simple descriptions of subhuman monsters that we hear so often on television. Several years ago, Dr. Bruce Western did a sociological study of people returning home from prison in Boston. He published a book about it and said, violence is a lifetime reality for people who go to prison. It grows out of the chaotic context of poverty and its accompanying disadvantages. Given the contextual character of violence, the roles of victim, witness, and perpetrator are not neatly divided among individuals. Instead, one comes to play all of these parts as their life course unfolds. A key implication at the, is those with a history of offending have been victims and witnesses to violence for even longer. This is so critical. It is so important that we look beyond the solutions that have largely failed us for so long and open ourselves to new ideas. When you meet the people who have been through this, you know that they have that, that, that there have to be better ways. Bruce Western also said, this moral complexity where victims and offenders are often one and the same is challenging for a justice system designed to assess guilt or innocence and mete out punishment. Historically, we have punished violence as an assault of the strong on the weak. The larger challenge now is to heal the frailty from which violence springs. I understand how complicated all this is. 
as someone who has been both a victim and perpetrator myself, it took me years to make sense of my own feelings about all of this and come to some conclusions about what needs to be done. Politically, this may often seem impossible, but in the last five years, I've seen a huge amount of meaningful changes and the people in this room have a lot of collective power. Even when the going is going to require changing a lot of hearts and minds in the process, and hopefully conferences like this play a part in that. What good does it do anyone to continue to be part of a so-called solution that makes the core problems facing our communities even worse? At times, it might make good politics, but it never makes for good policies. At the end of the day, we should be about trying to make our Michigan communities safer. As the authors of this report that we're talking about today concluded, imposing long sentences in the name of public protection is both ironic and counterproductive. Such sentences are unsupported by actual data on recidivism and are often most imposed on the people who are the least likely to repeat their offenses. They substantially hamper the ability of people to be productive and self-sufficient when they are eventually released and they require taxpayers to spend tens of millions of dollars annually for the illusion of increased safety. Thanks so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed the rest of the day in the report. I will now take any questions you have, but they've asked me to tell you to use the microphones if you're going to ask a question. Thanks. <laughs> Any questions? Okay. Oh. Okay, Joe. Josh, Well, I mean, I think one of the things that we're really hoping will get done this year, although it's not specific to this report, is uh, making juvenile life without parole sentences uh, no longer a part of Michigan law. Uh, given how many people have already been resentenced for that, I'm hopeful that we can do something with that. So the is this on? Okay. So the long people serving you say people serving long indeterminate sentences in the Michigan prisons. We depend on them in some way to help mentor the prison population. So what do we say to people who kind of use that against the argument that we 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 should not have people serving long indeterminate sentences, and that there's sort of a trade-off there to the benefit. I mean, yeah, there's definitely a trade-off in the sense that if you take the people who are serving long and indeterminate sentences out of prison, that they can no longer mentor the people who are still in prison. But I would hate to have to, I would hate to, have to instrumentalize those people's lives and make them only a servant to trying to be mentors for other people in prison when they could come out and live their lives and be with their families and their loved ones. So to me, the most important thing is that people get home, they get home in better place than when they left, and they get to reunite with their families and try to make a productive life for themselves. So, yes, I do think that is to some extent a concern, but I'm much more worried about uh, those human beings getting to do what they want to do with their lives. Uh, we can certainly find other ways to mentor folks in prison. If it means that people like me or other people in the room go back, you know, I'm sure all of us would be more than willing to do that. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Josh. We heard this morning about the variability and the arbitra arbitrariness of the guidelines, but I think we really, it was important to have a presentation like that to, uh, to bring it home and show just how much it mattered. So we're going to talk now about the recommendations for change. We're going to have a panel discussion of options for increasing proportionality and reducing disparity. 
I'll introduce in a second the, uh, our moderator and our speakers. I wanted to remind everyone of the index cards in front of them. We can either ask questions at the microphone to the panel or write questions down on the index cards and uh, people will collect them and pass them up to the moderator as well. So our moderator is uh, Dr. Amanda Burgess Proctor, Associate Professor of Criminal Justice at Oakland University. Her primary research interests include intimate partner abuse, sexual victimization, and crime and drug policy. She's also a consultant with the Center for Behavioral Health and Justice at Wayne State University, for which she recently co-authored a report on women in Michigan's jails. She's past chair of the Division on Women in Crime of the American Society of Criminology, and in 2019, she was appointed by the governor to chair the Michigan Criminal Justice Policy Commission. And we have six panelists. Um, thank you, Dr. Proctor. I think as I call everyone's names, we can uh, uh, move up to the table or all of them, whichever is easiest. Uh, judge Douglas uh, Shapiro. Judge Douglas Shapiro is a judge for the third district of the Michigan Court of Appeals since 2009. Judge Shapiro began his legal career in 1986 as a law clerk to Justice James Brickley of the Michigan Supreme Court. In 1989, he served as an assistant defender in the State Appellate Defender's Office, and he then served as a staff attorney with the Center for Social Gerontology. He worked in private practice until he after that until he joined the Court of Appeals. Judge Mariam Bazi. Judge Bazi has served on the Third Circuit Court since 2017. She previously had served as an assistant Wayne County prosecutor. She currently serves in the criminal division where she oversees a mental health court docket in addition to her regular duties. She also serves on the court executive committee and on the strategic planning team where she is the judicial sponsor of the diversity and inclusion committee. Judge Christopher Yates. Judge Christopher Yates was appointed to the Kent County Circuit Court on April 22, 2008. He has served in both the criminal and civil division and the family division of that court, and he was assigned to run the specialized business docket for the court. Judge Yates also has worked as a federal prosecutor in Detroit, as an attorney advisor in the Office of Legal Counsel at the U.S. Department of Justice, and as chief federal public defender for the Western District in Michigan, and then in private practice. He is the current president of the Michigan Judges Association. Prosecutor Carol Seaman. Before serving as the elected Ingham County Prosecutor beginning in 2017, Carol Seaman spent over 11 years as an assistant Ingham County Prosecutor, including four years as Chief of the Juvenile Division. She also served as the Child Abuse Training Coordinator for the Prosecuting Attorneys Association of Michigan with the Office of Michigan Children's Ombudsman. She investigated child wel welfare agencies throughout the state of Michigan. As a consultant with Public Policy Associates, she worked on issues involving race equity and disproportionate representation of persons of color in our state's juvenile and child protection services. I should say as a prosecutor, uh, Prosecutor Seaman has been very willing to do the right thing for folks in the system and, uh, and, and to make the right policy decisions, even if they're not always the most popular decisions. And Yantis. Um, I saw on the screen Ann Yantis, uh, my former colleague at the State Appellate Defender Office, is a, is a sentencing consultant working with court-appointed and retained attorneys to promote more favorable sentencing outcomes. Ann credits her knowledge of Michigan fe fe felony sentencing law to the many years she spent handling plea and sentencing appeals with the State Appellate Defender Office. Following her time at Sato, Ann taught criminal sentencing at University of Detroit Mercy School of Law and served as pro bono counsel with Bodman PLC. And Deputy Public Defender Kareem Johnson from the Jackson County Public Defender. In 13 years of private criminal practice, Mr. Johnson has tried cases ranging from first-degree murder to operating while intoxicated, practiced in 17 different counties with a focus in Wayne, Oakland, Macomb, and Ingham. In December of 2019, Kareem joined the office of Jackson County Public Defender. Kareem joined the office intending to make it the premier litigation firm in Michigan. So thank you to our distinguished panelists, an excellent representation of prosecutors, defense, judges, and other actors in our criminal legal system. Hi, everyone. Can you hear okay? All right, awesome. 
Uh, I'm Amanda Burgess Proctor. Good afternoon. It's uh, a pleasure to be here and to see so many of uh, my colleagues um, with whom I worked in the Criminal Justice Policy Commission. Um, I am a criminologist uh, and uh, on faculty in the Criminal Justice Program at Oakland University. I've spent the last 20 plus years of my life researching and teaching um, uh, about crime and uh, working in various facets in the justice system. So what I thought we would do, um, I've asked each of our panelists today um, to, you've heard their sort of, you know, our professional introductions, um, but I've asked each of them to speak a little bit um, about themselves, the perspective from which they are approaching this conversation, and also the area um, that they think is in need of most pressing change or the most urgent need as we have this conversation. But before we do that, I thought I would direct your attention to the recommendations in the report. So we've heard so much about the data. We've had um, just really fascinating conversations. And, and I want to take a minute, uh, presentations, I should say. I want to take a minute here to recognize the authors of this report. I know you look at it and you see hundreds of pages and all of these charts and graphs. Um, it's an extraordinary amount of work, and it's just really, really well done. And so I want to acknowledge um, that and to thank them for their time and effort with that. It's really well done. Um, but on page 171 uh, is where, that's chapter 17, are the recommendations for change. So we've heard about the data and we've heard about the sort of uh, the, the practical impact of some of um, the issues um, that the report addresses. But the recommendations are what we are here to discuss. What should we do with this information that we've covered today? So on page 171, um, you will see the recommendations for change. So I'll just, I'm not going to read the whole entire thing. Um, the first one, uh, establish a commission with the mandate and scope of authority um, of the former Criminal Justice Policy Commission, uh, which sunset in 2019. Make compliance with the guideline recommendations mandatory, allow departures only for substantial and compelling reasons. And then there's enumerated a series of fundamental structural changes, um, as well as other uh, recommendations on page 172 for increasing proportionality and for reducing disparity. So it's important that um, I wanted to make sure everyone at least had the chance to peruse this uh, briefly before we begin talking. So what I'd like to do is to um, just go down our list, uh, beginning with Judge Shapiro, and just have you talk a little bit about um, sort of why you're here and what you think we should be focusing on uh, first and foremost. Yes, I'm supposed to put this on. Sorry. Um, you know, I, I sit in a somewhat different position. Well, I guess we all do. Uh, I was talking earlier with a colleague about it that, you know, I don't see the downward departures. And so it was kind of stunning to read the report and, and understand uh, how many downward departures there are. Where I sit, there's only upward departures, uh, often extraordinary upward departures. And so that's my bias in a sense. Um, I have a lot of questions about the sentencing guidelines. I mean, I remember... Uh, when I was a clerk, and then when I uh, worked at Sado for a while, that I never really understood the, the, the empirical basis for any of the numbers in the guidelines, and I, I, I still don't. And it seems to me that the process has largely been, uh, let's just build it and we'll see what happens, but nobody's ever going to see what happens. And the modifications that are made uh, are not done with, an with, with a view towards an overall systemic problem, which is, you know, I, I was sitting down to write my thoughts, and then I turned to page 171 just to refresh my recollection. I realized, like, oh, all my thoughts are right here. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, that's kind of where I come from. I think we need a, a wholesale uh, a, a change of approach. Um, I, I find certain things in my work to be uh, particularly difficult, which is uh, just some small things. For example, when, when there's going to be a, 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 a deviation upwards, uh, or there doesn't seem to be, you know, the guidelines are all presumptively okay, et cetera, et cetera. There seems to never be any discussion about the fact that the guidelines are a range, at least from where I sit, that, you know, it may be five years to eight years, and that means the guidelines are eight years. Um, as opposed to, you could have gotten five years, but you've done X, Y, and Z, and so I'm going to give you the top of the range. Um, that seems to, to be lost. I think that... Um, 
we tend to get lost in the trees and lose the forest um, in these long and difficult disputes over how to score an OV-13 or OV-4, whichever it is. These are important. But the fact is these are really largely minor issues when you look at the broader problems that have been described in the report. Uh, and yet it creates the somewhat of an illusion that we're doing something. You know, we're, we're modifying or we're, we're revising the guidelines to be more accurate. But I, I don't really think we are. Um, the problem of ranges from where I sit is enormous. Uh, I had a case uh, that uh, we worked on in this month where the range, from, of course, it's a, it's a, a long habitual, but the range was 61 years uh, from the lowest possible sentence to the, how do you review that? Um, you know, what, what's, what is a, uh, an appropriate sentence in a range of 61 years? Um, and I'm not, I don't know how much time we have, so I'm gonna, I guess I will just uh, stop there and pass it on and then wait for my chance to say something else. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for inviting me here. And I can say that I really learned a lot. I, I had the ability to get this report prior to coming here. And prior to, I guess, receiving this report, I guess I never really thought about where the guidelines came from. Um, they, as a judge over at uh, the Third Circuit Court, I only uh, oversee a criminal uh, docket. And so we're constantly calculating guidelines. And I appreciate the fact that there are guidelines there, there's something to kind of tell me where I should be sentencing, uh, where the sentence should fall in. But I do agree some of those ranges are particularly enormous. Um, I think that uh, one of the things that I heard today that I used to actually say uh, to a certain extent when I was a prosecutor is justice depended on who your prosecutor was, who your defense attorney is, and who your judge is. And that's unfortunate. And I think the guidelines try to, I guess, uh, really bring rein that in a little bit, but uh, one thing that was striking to me is that these guidelines, as mentioned before, were put into place at a time when we were, we had these policies of being tough on crime and uh, really increasing incarceration, and it's been 30 years since we've really taken a whole systematic approach at looking at them. So when I look at what the uh, my biggest policy recommendation would be, would be the establishment of a commission to oversee uh, the guidelines. I think all the suggestions are suggestions that we should be talking about, that we sh should be discussing in the broader context of how do we, how does this all fit in? Um, and I think it's unfortunate that it's taken this long, um, hopefully, to start this conversation in a meaningful way where there can be a commission and we can start uh, tackling some of these issues. And so I guess I'll, I'll let someone else speak. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I grew up with the sentencing guidelines. My first job out of law school was clerking for the chief judge of the Eastern District of Michigan. I started in 1987. Uh, shortly thereafter, the federal sentencing guidelines came out in their first form. And for those of you who have been around long enough, you'll remember the initial guidelines were about that thick. You could put them in a three-ring binder, and they were easy to manage. Now, of course, they're more complicated than the user manual for an F-35 fighter jet. I say that because uh, I had so much experience with the federal sentencing guidelines that that was really my perspective in the first instance. Uh, after I clerked, I was a federal prosecutor in Detroit. After that, I ran the Federal Public Defender's Office in Grand Rapids. And after that, I represented private clients. So I, I got an opportunity to see quite a bit before I even hit the state bench. Um, what I'll say about the federal sentencing guidelines before I get to the Michigan guidelines is that they proved two things. First of all, that if you really want to enforce relative uniformity and proportionality, you can do it. But second, it requires an enormous investment of assets. Uh, the federal sentencing guidelines were amended and amended and amended every single time the commission had an aberrant decision, they'd amend the guidelines again. And so from one day to the next, you couldn't even tell what the guidelines prescribed anymore. And the second thing is that the judges on the U.S. Court of Appeals had to be extremely busy and aggressive enforcing the guidelines. And even then, I mean, trial judges are trial judges. They don't like to be told what to do. Uh, I had one case where we had appealed, and I'd handled the appeal, and we got Judge Cohn reversed because he'd struck a guideline as unconstitutional. Well, it came back, and he called us in from one of his famous in-chambers meetings, 
And uh, it was clear that he was extremely unhappy with me for getting him reversed because the case had gotten a lot of publicity. And he sat down and he said, well, what are you going to do to me if I give another six-month sentence instead of giving the 18 I'm supposed to give? What are you going to do? And I said, we're not going to appeal. Just don't strike the guideline as unconstitutional. He broke into a broad smile and said, see, the guidelines work perfectly as long as no one appeals. And I think there you see a lot of the tension that I think we're going to find in Michigan as well if we start to work with these again, because trial judges are a kind of an independent breed, and we don't have to get anyone to agree before we do anything. And so one of the hats I'm wearing today is as the president of the Michigan Judges Association, and I'll try to be clear when I have that hat on rather than my Chris Yates, former prosecutor, former public defender, former criminal judge, um, because I, I will say from a personal perspective, the guidelines dramatically need to be changed in a couple of significant ways. First of all, um, if you want judicial buy-in at the trial court level, uh, I would strongly suggest that one of the things you do is follow the path of my former partner who's now on the House Judiciary Committee, David Legrand, and build into the guidelines reductions. It is unthinkable to me that you would set up a guideline system like Michigan has and every single offense variable would be an increase and not a single offense variable would be a decrease. That makes absolutely no sense. Uh, why there are not reductions for minor role in the offense or for acceptance of responsibility or for any number of downward adjustments that are available under the federal guidelines ha has never, ever made any sense to me. And I don't know how they got put together that way, but there's a bill I don't know whether it's been formally introduced yet, but it's in the works to build in 10, 12, 15 OVs that would re result in reductions. Um, the second thing that I would say about the Michigan guidelines is I'm certainly sensitive to the fact that some of the ranges are so broad as to be almost absolute uh, grants of discretionary authority to the sentencing judge. And to the extent that that can be reined in some uh, that's all to the good as long as it's done within the confines of our two-thirds rule in Michigan. And then the final thought I'd offer is that I, I hate to ask the Court of Appeals judges to take up this calling, but for those of us in the trial courts, we really don't know half as well as you might think whether our sentences are wildly inconsistent with what's happening in a county across the state or even in a courtroom just down the hall from us, one of the difficulties of being a trial court judge is it's really isolating. Before you get to the trial bench, you understand what's going on in all the courts where you practice. Once you become a trial judge, the only thing you know is what happens within the four walls of your own courtroom. And I can tell you, uh, just on my floor where I have chambers and two other judges have chambers, uh, I have two colleagues, both of whom I, I like quite a bit because I spend a lot of time with them, and their sentences couldn't be more inconsistent. <laughs> I mean, and so depending on whether you draw the judge in courtroom 11B or courtroom 11D, uh, the outcome from a sentencing perspective could be dramatically different. Now, I, I get that different judges have different sentencing philosophies, and you're never going to get all of us to sentence completely consistently with one another. But I, I do think that if more judges were exposed to the kind of data we're getting today and particularly in the context of how that meshes with their own sentencing practices, it would do a world of good. Uh, because I think a lot of us just think that the way we sentence is the way we should be sentenced. I, I was a quintessential guideline sentencer. I never once departed upward. Uh, in the cases where I thought the guideline range was too high, I usually tried to work uh, with the prosecutor and the defense attorney to modify the charge in some significant way to get to a fair result. Um, I saw that happen in federal court where a fair number of judges would bring the lawyers and the prosecutor and defense lawyer and say, okay, the sentence is too high. How are we going to make it work? <laughs> and all of that would happen off the record. And then we'd go in and the objections would be made and everybody knew what the outcome was going to be on the objections. And we'd get to a fair sentence in everybody's view. Um, but I, I do think that education of the trial bench would be really helpful. So uh, I'm sorry I went on a bit long, but uh, I have an awful lot of thoughts about this, and thank you very much for letting me share them. Um, I just, we have oodles of time, so everyone should, I will, I'll, I'll, I'll nudge you if you need. Okay. 
Uh, thank you. So I've been a lawyer since uh, 1981, and I was a judicial law clerk of a circuit court um, in the 80, 82 and 83 before I went to the prosecutor's office. So sentencing guidelines were um, discretionary and just coming into effect, the judicial guidelines. And during the entire time I was an assistant prosecutor, um, they were also discretionary. The ju the legislative guidelines that we're talking about that are now old were did not exist when I was an assistant prosecutor. So, you know, the role of guidelines, I think, when I came back as the elected prosecutor after 22 years of being gone from prosecution, I could really see some fairly dramatic differences. And one of the, um, there were a number of uh, practice changes that really resulted, and one is that we do an extraordinary amount of sentence bargaining in Ingham County, a uh, little less now than we did when I started, but because to tr to try to deal with that incredible uncertainty with these ranges that vary so much. Uh, so in my 11 years as an assistant prosecutor, I just I started seeing certain patterns, and now as the elected, I'm seeing how they um, fit in with charging decisions, sentencing um, decisions, and the sentence guidelines. Um, and some of the things that were raised by Barb and other people here today are ones that as the prosecutor who is trying to achieve justice, I'm very concerned um, about how we look at criminal history, how we look at the double counting of some kinds of uh, either elements of the crime or things that count as prior record variables, um, how we score multiple prior convictions, um, which were designed to see if you had a chance for rehabilitation between one conviction and sentence and the next. Um, and things of that nature. And of course, race equity um, was something that I was very concerned about, um, both in the uh, misdemeanors and uh, certainly with felonies. Um, I knew right away when I came into the office that I wanted to start working with data, which is absolutely not a skill I have, but I knew how important it was. Um, so by looking just at some of the things that were pending right then and some of the national patterns, first of all, right away, I had the opportunity to look at juvenile life without parole and did have those resentenced immediately because philosophically, I'm not a supporter of life without parole. I believe everyone should be reviewed. I believe in second chance reviews and certainly for juveniles. Um, so that was one of my very first um, decisions was that we would resentence on the juvenile life without parole and that all waivers um, would have to come through me for permission. And again, these were um, to, to try to avoid the huge discrepancies between somebody, like say if you have three 15-year-olds involved in an offense and you might have one who ends up in the juvenile system for four years, one who goes to prison, uh, like without the possibility of parole, and someone else who did eight years in an adult prison or something. So I uh, looked at that. The other thing I did almost immediately in 2017 was modify our habitual offender um, pop, pop practice and policy. Um, I've amended it at once since, and I will need to do so again. But basically, it's to try to look at those things, such as the number of prior convictions arising out of the same transaction, which technically can all be counted uh, towards um, augmenting the sentence exposure, but it makes no real sense. So our policy is you're not supposed to do that. So if you have three felonies arising out of the same transaction that you're only going to have, if you're habitualized at all, it'll be just one of those habituals. Um, so those are a number of things. Um, some of you may have heard uh, that more recently I've had policies regarding resisting and obstructing police and felony firearm, which came out of a safe and just uh, Michigan report, and uh, not having a policy with a serious look at not charging with non-public safety traffic stops where there's a search and, um, amazingly enough, usually CC, uh, carry a weapon or drugs or other contraband are recovered. So my approach to the sentencing guidelines um, really came from knowing from uh, being an active prosecution, the disp racial dis and economic disproportionality I was seeing. And so uh, and I'm going to stop in mere moments, but um, I finally was able to uh, get the a work uh, a agreement with the very Institute of Justice, and we've been working with them for about two years now. We're finishing up. And to look at our data as best as we're able to get it, which is always a problem with prosecution data, and then to make recommendations. And right now we're in that stage where we're looking at 
For example, how do we look at criminal history and making charging and plea bargain decisions when we know that if you are a person of color, your chances of having a criminal record are going to be much higher than if you are a white person. So what is the proper role of looking at criminal history, for example, when I'm deciding whether to charge between a misdemeanor or a felony, or what sentence, kind of plea bargain or sentence agreement we might be reaching? So there are a lot of things that I'm hoping that we will be able to do that will kind of pull these threads together. Um, but when I came to it, it was the primary understanding that for people in poverty, and for persons of color, that the system it doesn't necessarily work terribly well for anyone, but it really doesn't work for those individuals. So that's been kind of my primary focus on what I'm doing um, as the elected prosecutor. Are you looking at me? All right, I'm guessing I'm supposed to speak. So hello, everyone. I can see the panel. I can't see the audience. Um, it's, um, I think, Safe and Just Michigan for allowing me to appear virtually today. That's very um, generous of them. And um, I like the recommendations that were made by the other panelists, um, especially the one by Judge Yates about the reductions built into the guidelines. Uh, when I started practicing at Sado, it was um, right before the second edition of the judicial guidelines came into effect. And to tell you the truth, I'd forgotten that the first edition had some reductions built in. And when I was first reading this new guidelines booklet that was put out by Safe and Just Michigan, I thought, that doesn't sound accurate to me. So I went into my basement and I found that original guidelines manual and lo and behold, there were reductions. Um, they didn't last into the second edition, but there were a few reductions. Um, so it would be great to see reductions coming back into the guidelines. Um, but what I also thought I would talk about is on page 172 of the book uh, booklet, there is a recommendation that um, armed robbery be moved from a class A to a class B and that um, unarmed carjacking be moved from a class, I think it's an A to a class C. I think moving it to C would make it consistent with unarmed robbery. And, you know, I like those recommendations, but I would go much further. So toward the end of my time with Sado, I had focused quite a bit on felony sentencing and I was teaching it. And um, so I wrote an article where I looked um, very broadly at increasing penalties in Michigan. And one of the things that I saw that was that with the legislative sentencing guidelines, that after they were enacted in 1999, that the legislature went in on a very, what appeared to be a very piecemeal basis, and they would change maximum penalties and move crimes to higher crime classes. You almost never see reductions, um, except for the recent jail task force. Um, legislation, but you know, you could trace a lot of increases over the years. And I, without a sentencing commission, it really seems like we've lost that um, hierarchy of crimes in terms of ranking crimes in terms of seriousness. And I'm going to give you an example that I had put in the article I'd written. So I think today we talked um, mostly about class A offenses the um, life maximum penalties, assault with intent to murder, CSE first degree and armed robbery. Um, and I think most of you are familiar with class, some of the common class C offenses, which correlates roughly with a 15 year maximum penalty. And those are unarmed robbery, um, manslaughter, drunk driving, causing death. Um, but it's the class B that I find interesting because that corresponds um, roughly with 20 year maximum penalties. And you have the strangest crimes in the class B and crimes that I think don't necessarily make sense, in part because the guidelines legislation, um, the original you know, legislative guidelines, um, there was a there was there was a guiding principle that crimes of violence against a person were supposed to be treated more um, severely than other crimes. And yet, if you look at class B offenses, that's not necessarily what you see. You would think that between class A, the life offenses, and class 
see, you know, the unarmed robbery, manslaughter, and drunk driving causing death, that you'd see these very serious assaults of crimes in class B. But I'm going to give you an example of some crimes that were moved into class B that I think it doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, in 2006, embezzlement by an agent, if it was over $100,000, became a 20-year maximum penalty in a class B offense. And then the same thing happened with false pretenses in 2011. Um, and I also noticed in looking at the manual yesterday, the guidelines manual, that money laundering $10,000 or more is a class B crime. And granted, that's connected with um, controlled substance offenses. But it's these property crimes that have a 20-year maximum penalty in a class B um, in the guidelines that I wonder about, and they don't seem to make a lot of sense. And I think not only is it, you know, not following the guiding principle that crimes against crimes of violence against a person are treated more severely, but I think, for example, if you look at it from a victim's perspective, would you rather be a victim of uh, false pretenses over a hundred thousand dollars, which I think is a horrifying crime? I would not want to be a victim of, or would you rather be a victim of manslaughter? Well, I would probably choose false pretenses. Um, and yet, you know, false pretenses seems like the less serious crime, but it's treated more um, harshly in the sentencing guidelines. And I'll give you another one other example. In terms of class B, you have these property crimes with, you know, $100,000 um, threshold, but then you have what seems like a legitimate crime for class B, which is resisting and obstructing an officer causing death. So I think that a sentencing commission really needs to work out um, the ranking of um, felony offenses and do some juggling because I, I think the legislature likes to be responsive when there's a um, when there's a high profile crime that maybe doesn't seem like it was punished most severely enough or when there's a rash of crimes, um, but. You can't do so in a vacuum. You really have to consider how this fits in with, you know, the other crimes. So that is, those are my comments today. Good afternoon. Uh, I see it. I think I'm the only person on the panel that currently practices criminal defense. Uh, so I have a, a different perspective on the guidelines because you know, I started practicing in 2008, so I've always had uh, sentencing guidelines to deal with. So the recommendations, and I don't want to repeat what have already been said, but the first thing I would do uh, is adopt a recommendation to publish the sentencings from county to county. Uh, having practiced in a total of 17 different counties uh, was a daily basis for me to understand, you know, if you had what we call straddle cell guidelines, guidelines where a judge can give you probation, county jail, or single prison. You may not worry about it too much in Wayne County, but if you drove right up the road to Macomb County, or Oakland County, you may be concerned that your your client would would be going to prison, and that would be a conversation that you would have. Uh, I agree. I believe that upward deviations from the guidelines should not be allowed, uh, particularly after today. These guidelines are debated, studied, every possible. Uh, factor that can go into a case is listed. There's no reason for any judge to exceed the guidelines range in a case. Uh, and I think that that opens the door for disparity. I've often argued when doing sentences, particularly what CSEs, particularly if, the, if it's an alleged serial rapist or a shooting case where somebody shoots into a crowd, that you know, th three or more crimes against a person is factored, uh, both for general uh, crimes, crimes against a person, and CSC. So the legislature contemplated that. They just may not have uh, assessed the, the requisite amount of points to make a prosecutor or a trial judge happy, but the the thought process was there, at least in my opinion. So that's one thing that I would uh, recommend. Closing down the disparity in sentencing is another thing I would recommend because as we've already seen today through the, the data, particularly with armed robbery, an uh, armed robbery sentence could greatly vary depending on whether or not it's an individual who goes into a, a liquor store or gas station and robs a gas station, or if it's a, a drug deal or some sort of 
a gang interaction that went bad. You know, judges tend to uh, take those things into consideration, in my experience, when the argument is made. So limiting that uh, discrepancy and disparities uh, could bring some uniformity. A lot of the offense variables are so subjective, particularly uh, exportation and captivity and aggravated physical abuse. And it puts, in my opinion, everybody on the spot. It is extremely difficult, uh, when, especially if you're doing a CSE sentencing. Uh, you know, if somebody's kidnapped or drugged from one location to another, I don't see too many defense attorneys arguing against exportation of captivity. It's the, the acquaintance rape or the date rape crimes where you, you put in a situation where you have to argue, well, you know, judge, everybody gets held down during a rape. I mean, that's, that's the point. And you, you find yourself uh, being in a position where you try not to belittle uh, a victim, somebody who's either there's been a jury verdict that has found your client guilty or your client has admitted to victimizing this person. And now you put yourselves in a position when you're trying to argue guidelines where you may be belittling this person in front of a judge, in front of them, in front of their family. And so it really creates uh, just a bad taste, I believe, in everybody's mouth to have to argue those things. Um, I think moving armed robbery down to the B-grid is, is fair, especially since the, the data shows that so many judges are deviating below the guidelines anyway. And I would agree that mitigating factors should be worked into the guidelines. You argue those every day at sentencing anyway. Most judges try and take them into account. Uh, codifying those to give some uniformity uh, would be good. And that's pretty much my recommendations. Thank you. Thank you to each of our panelists. Um, I'm so grateful that we started um, with that. It's, it's interesting to see uh, just in that brief amount of time, there's some coalescence around several of these recommendations, um, which I think is exciting. So before um, I move the conversation forward, did anyone have note cards? Do you have questions? Would you like to begin with those? I don't know where that stands. We offered uh, note cards in case, I didn't realize there'd be microphones in case folks didn't want to stand up and talk. Um, I wanna make sure I'm responsive. So if there's questions from all of you that you'd like to pose or like to write down, we can start with that. Otherwise I'll start with some uh, a, a conversation and, and await your questions if you'd like to submit them. Does that sound good? Okay. So uh, I was talking earlier, um, you know, I just think this, I, I have many thoughts, but, it, you know, it struck me as, as we were, as, as I was listening to the presentations this morning, and I, I shared this with a few of you, that some of this for me is just, it's, it's so straightforward. So, you know, I was saying, if you, if you found out that you had been diagnosed with cancer and your oncologist told you that you were going to be treated with the chemotherapy protocol that was developed in 1998 and hadn't been evaluated for efficacy since, that you, you probably wouldn't be enthused about that, right? If you had purchased a car and the last time the safety standards uh, were examined was 1998, right? You wouldn't maybe feel great confidence. Um, and so this for me is even just a matter of of having the implementation of a policy that has not been reviewed in a in a systematic way with the express purpose of making recommendations to change, right? I mean, we have this wonderful report and we've had other analyses before, but practically speaking, a lot has changed since then. And so thinking about it, you know, maybe trying to extract it from this this sort of, uh, you know, potentially partisan conversation or this, you know, sort of this, this giant task, right? When you think about it in terms of it's been a long time and things have really changed and it's incumbent um, upon uh, our system uh, to make sure that we're operating with the most up-to-date information. I, I don't think that's a terribly radical observation to make. Um, okay, so I'll start, I guess, with a question for uh, the panelists. Um, okay, so what's the, what's the barrier? <laughs> everyone everyone in this room agrees 
um, or presumably it doesn't uh, voice significant objections to the creation of a sentencing commission or a policy commission or is open to some of these. We've heard several of our panelists talk about um, downward departures or um, OVs uh, that would include mitigating factors. Um, so, so what are the challenges? I think building the business case is the way I look at it. I mean, that's ultimately what it is we were talking about. These statistics are, um, they were pretty surprising and uh, they're important. And as Judge Yates indicated, a lot of our colleagues, a lot of people don't know, but we have to. But a lot of people are also going to say those statistics are 10 years old. When I look at the criminal division over at the Third Circuit Court, I actually went through, I want to say about a week ago, since the statistics uh, were reviewed from 2012, I think there are about 17 new judges on our criminal docket because we have 23 judges in total. And so um, I think it might be easy for people to say, well, that doesn't reflect what I'm doing. That's someone else. And so I think it's really important to make sure that uh, the data before we go in with a lot of these uh, structural changes, which I, I agree, I'm I'm a full proponent of uh, really looking at these, and I think there are some changes that need to happen uh, quickly. But I, I do also think that you have to take the time to build the right business case because you want to catch people and bring them in. You don't want them to be uh, churned off from it by finding some of those loopholes that we, we, we know kind of exist just by looking at it uh, briefly. Um, I'm going to answer this question with my president of MJA hat on now because I haven't had a criminal docket for 10 years. Uh, I run the specialized business docket, but I certainly have had lots of talks with my colleagues about it. In the last um, MJA executive board meeting last week devolved into a massive complaining session about taking away judicial discretion. So in the last two years, we've been through probation reform, parole reform, bail reform. And there are two ways in which I think judges are concerned. One is we feel the ground's constantly shifting below, beneath our feet. And the other is it seems like every single thing in the criminal arena coming out of Lansing is just another straitjacket, another straitjacket, another straitjacket. They don't trust judges. Why won't they let judges be judges? So I would encourage you to think about uh, what, what seems to be a popular term today, low-hanging fruit. There are lots of things on which we judges all the way across the spectrum from left to right support. One of them is elimination of the two-year consecutive term for felony firearm. We want more discretion. We hate that law. Uh, we've gone and testified repeatedly in Lansing to try to get it changed to just a guideline scored offense rather than a two-year consecutive term. And I think there would be 100% buy-in from the Michigan Judges Association on that. Next, uh, I know I've talked about it already, and uh, Ann Yentis help, helpfully picked up on it as well. If you build in OV reductions, that's something we know how to do. We don't feel like our discretion is being cabined by that. Write a lot of those. Work with David LeGrand. Get those things in there. Third, if you want to do something that I think will meaningfully lead to people being reduced, uh, released sooner, deal with the problem with truth in sentencing. I mean, we used to have disciplinary credits in good time. We don't have that anymore. Why don't we have that anymore? And, and that's something that doesn't even affect the way the judges do their jobs. That's the back half of it. I mean, that's when people are eligible for their earliest release. So um, personally... I support just about everything that we've heard about today, but on, speaking on behalf of the whole association, uh, some of these things are going to be hard sells, but there are a lot of things that will meaningfully change how long people have to spend in custody where you will not just be avoiding a fight with the Michigan Judges Association. You'll actually have us four square behind you. So uh, those are just three ideas, and I'll float a couple more as we move through this, but there are lots of ways to accomplish what you want to accomplish. I will support the commission, and I will support the commission immediately. Uh, again, having practiced all over the state, I have never met a judge that said I sentenced wrong. Every judge, <laughs> every judge thinks that what they do is right, and they judges are smart. I've never, I've honestly never met a judge that I thought was dumb. They can legally justify what it is that they want to do, and there are too many factors that are not in the sentencing guidelines that determine 
what sentence you get, whether or not your judge was a, a former prosecutor, former defense attorney, whether they were civil, uh, whether or not a, a judge is black or white, uh, the county the judge practices in. These are all things defense attorneys talk about before they go into sentencing. Whether your judge has a particular pet peeve with certain type of crimes, narcotics trafficking, uh, gang crimes, violence against women. And I understand nobody likes uh, control taken from them. I, I, I completely agree with that. But reducing the ability to use discretion also reduces the risk of there being improper disparities in sentencing. And that's why I think the commission is important. Yeah, politically, uh, uh, judges are elected officials. And, you know, you see it all the time with the Supreme Court, right? You, you have a Supreme Court, the U.S. Supreme Court. You take a Supreme Court uh, justice who was just approved by everybody two weeks ago, right? And then when they move up to the Supreme Court, there's always a big fight. Right, so judges have to be reelected, and they have communities that they uh, that support them, and they don't want to let those communities down. And there's a, I believe, a certain level of familiarity. You know, growing up and, and spending a lot of time in Detroit, uh, certain things don't bother me. Uh, people who grow up in rural areas may not understand, you know, gang crimes, or you know, a robbery, or the narcotics trade, and it's just something that is unfamiliar to them, it doesn't make them comfortable. So eliminating those uh, uh, disparities and the discretion allows for us to legislate out a particular judge's lack of life experience in a particular area, uh, which may make sentences uniform. And one thing that's not discussed is the probation department and how the probation, the Michigan Department of Corrections feel about your client. Because it's been my experience that typically uh, general courtroom prosecutors don't have time to go through everybody's guidelines on a sentencing. Uh, now, a, a specially assigned prosecutor will go through the guidelines. But typically, if it's just a general courtroom prosecutor, they look at what the probation department said, and if you argue against what the probation department said, then they just defend the probation department. So a, a lot of it, again, is something that we can't even address here, but just limiting the, dispari uh, the disparities in these sentencing cells is something that can make uniformity. So I think we all agree that a uh, sentencing commission is a great idea. Um, what it looks like or how we get there is going to be, you know, I guess what we're talking about. Um, I, I think it's really important that it be something that is created that continues to exist and it's not just a temporary, let's pull together legislators and people from the field and judges and, you know, and then have a temporary commission that makes recommendations. It needs to be uh, an entity that's staffed and that it has uh, an ability to go in and regulate review. Um, and uh, I love this suggestion of having kind of the judicial scorecard and not in a negative way. I think a lot of us really lose perspective on how our decisions are come across the board. And like both Judge Yates and, and Mr. Johnson said, um, that, that those are things that I think would be really helpful for the judiciary and for other people, you know, in the system. Um, I, one concern I have about um, doing this at this point in time is that having lived through the get tough on crime, the, when the crime really was going up in the 80s into the 90s, and when so many of the harsh punitive policies that we're now seeing play out were first going into effect, um, I guess that's a concern I would have is if we do this right now, we have to be really careful to pay attention that we're not bringing that get tough on crime perspective because I'm hearing a lot of it now and it's sounding to me like the 80s was sounding. And I can remember that kind of vividly still. So that would be just a caution that we need to make sure that that's kind of built into, somehow built into how we're creating the commission so that we don't reinvent the win wheel. I was talking to a representative on the lunch hour about the lack of institutional knowledge as um, certainly with term limits in the legislature, but as we go through almost every organization, like, you know, Barb retiring with Safe and Just Michigan, we lose the incremental institutional knowledge. So we need to find a way, in my opinion, that that is part, it, it, part of what we build in, that we bring back, like, 
um, the, the judge, uh, I'm sorry, the person on the screen, um, and it said about making sure we go down in the basement and dig out that old original, you know, document, uh, that we don't reinvent the wheel. We see what factors were, were being contemplated at that time and, and how that has played out over time. I have a question for Judge Yates. So let, if we talk about low-hanging fruit for a moment, you reference the Judges Association. Things like scoring elements of the offense or, or triple scoring priors, you know, PRVs, OVs, habitual. Um, what do you think that uh, the, uh, or, um, or allowing, the, not necessarily having to score the highest point level possible. What's your sense of, of how, how the uh, judges would, the trial judges would see that sort of stuff? Uh, I can tell you right now that not having to score the highest point total would be extraordinarily well received. That's a classic exercise of discretion, and you're absolutely right. I mean, the fact that we've set up all these, bina uh, these binary sentencing guidelines scoring is crazy. Um, everything comes in shades of gray, and sentencing guideline enhancements should as well. Uh, as far as the multiple scoring of criminal history, uh, that's one of those things that for judges who've been sentencing under the guidelines for a long time, they, they just take as rote, but nobody's ever really thought about it in the sort of detail and in stark relief the way it's been presented today. And so if that were part of a larger package of sentencing reform, I think you'd be surprised how few judges would really be concerned about that. So it, 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 Judge Shapiro makes a couple of really good points here because if you get buy-in from the judges, and, and he's given us a couple of great ideas where I think you're going to get buy-in from the judges, uh, we can deploy ourselves across the state and talk to legislators. We're always happy to go and testify in the House and the Senate to committees, and we'll help you build momentum for ideas like that. And, and I'm glad you brought those up because those are two excellent suggestions. Oh, go ahead. Oh, uh, Judge, were you finished with your comment? Did you want? Yes. Okay, go ahead. Um, and Judge Shapiro, if you have something, please please jump in. Um, so I wanted to follow up, um, and again on what Judge Yates said, um, because I find his recommendations very interesting. But I can't. I'm not sure I agree with the idea that judges need to have more discretion. Um, I think that mandatory minimum terms, I, pretty much everybody disagrees with those, and so I don't have a problem there. But I'm not sure that I would necessarily give judges more discretion at sentencing, in part because um, there was a book that came out in May. It was called Noise. I forget what the rest of the title was, but it was about um, noise and, and subjective, uh, professional subjective judgments. And it was about unfair, unwanted variation in subjective judgments. Um, and they had a chapter on sentencing. And they were talking about how, you know, there's bias, but then there's noise. Noise is just this unwanted variation. And obviously, judges have different um, judicial, they have different sentencing philosophies. But what was disturbing to me was that some of the things that influence sentences, even if a judge thinks, you know, they're trying very hard to um, impose the, you know, the the best sentence for this situation. But, you know, I think that we've heard that studies show that judges can be a little harsher with their sentences when they're hungry, you know, right before lunch. Um, and there was a study apparently that if your local sports team lost or your favorite sports team lost on Sunday, the judges could be harsher sort of unconsciously um, on Monday with their sentences. And um, what was the other one? that um, there was another one. Anyway, it was sort of disturbing by the thing, the things that influence the, and judges and they're, and they're unaware of it. So I'm not sure that I want more discretion so that we can have potentially more variation. Um, and I will say that this book on noise talks about decision hygiene practices and you know, sort of structuring the sentencing hearing so that the judge considers the factors, you know, objectively that they think are most important and really takes the time to weigh them. And I think if you have mitigating factors, you know, to find some way to objectively weigh them would be helpful. So uh, that would be a good idea. 
The other thing I wanted to say is um, when Judge Yates talked about we don't have any, you know, good time credits or disciplinary credits. Um, and last year I looked at this, I sort of looked at the history of good time. And my conclusion, having gone back to the 1800s when we first had our first good time statute, was that the good time statutes uh, were played around with and they were changed, you know, by the legislature, um, you know, every few years. But the longest period that there would be no change was roughly like 22, maybe 25 years. And then we're pretty much there now. So I'm very curious to see, because truth and sentencing went into effect in the end of 1998 for assault of crimes and the end of 2000 for um, all other crimes. So we're pretty much there now. And I think, you know, we have potentially a different um, generation of lawmakers. So it'll be interesting to see whether um, there's any movement there in terms of reductions for good behavior. So those are my comments. If folks have questions that you'd like to pose, surely the brain power up here, it's a lot. Okay. <laughs> yes, Josh. Uh, this one's for Judge Yates. I'm a little bit uh, curious as to how you navigate or how you would suggest navigating, not just in terms of what are low-hanging fruit kind of things to deal with policy, but in terms of what this report covers, the difference between the disparity in length that's left to just having judicial discretion mm -hmm. and letting judges be judges. How, do you nav how, how can you navigate those two things? Oops, sorry. Let me start by saying this. I I'm certainly not an advocate of unchanneled discretion. Because if you have unchanneled discretion, you're going to get what we had before we had any kind of sentencing guidelines at all, which is just wild disparities from judge to judge. Um, the other thing I'd say is that no matter how much you try to limit the discretion of judges in sentencing, there's only so much you can do because now that Lockridge has come down and the sentencing guidelines are advisory rather than binding, judges can get to where they want to get to. What I'm suggesting is put in a series of discretionary provisions that incentivize judges to exercise their discretion in a familiar way and in a direction that you want to go. That's why, for example, I, I mean, first and foremost, I hate to keep pounding away at this, but OVs that are reductions, or as Judge Shapiro points out, you don't have to score 50 points if the OV requires 50 points. You can score 10 if you think 10 is appropriate. That's the sort of thing that leads judges incentivized as they would be by the ability to exercise that discretion in the direction you want them to go. Um, I had a conversation with somebody at, at the beginning of the session this morning about how trial judges are in the main very bright and really good at figuring out how to get where they really want to go in a case. And at the end of the day, the trial judge is going to be the one who chooses the sentence to impose. So what you want to do is create an incentive structure that gets the judge to the result you're trying to get to. I mean, it, for whatever reason, there's this impulse right now to tell judges exactly what they have to do down to the last detail when we're in, we're enacting these criminal justice reforms. And these are very well-intentioned. They're all going in the right direction. I'm very supportive of these initiatives, but you've got to get buy-in from the trial bench because if you don't get buy-in from the trial bench, all they're going to do is fight against it. They're going to fight against it in the legislature, and then if it comes out of the legislature, they're going to fight against it case by case on the sentencing bench. And so I, I would... I'm pleading with everybody to understand what's likely to get people on board with what you're trying to accomplish here and what's likely to be counterproductive. That's all. I'd like to follow up on where Judge Yates has been, is going with that um, because it brings us to Lackridge and whether we should restructure the guidelines in a way that allows for mandatory enforcement. And so that raises a couple of questions. One is how judges felt about the guidelines when they had to have substantial and compelling reasons. And of course, that's reasons to go above or below 
pretty wide ranges when you're talking about the A grid. And I think, um, you know, I, I don't know if judges feel more hemmed in on the lower grids, but on the, on the life max grids, they got a lot of discretion. But um, in terms of being able to make our guidelines mandatory again, it could be done, but it would take a restructuring that took all that judicial fact-finding out and made it more like what Kelly described this morning and, and restructured it so it was offense severity just went according to the, the offense itself in the statute. It would still allow for consideration of aggravating and mitigating factors, but only as a grounds for departure. How do people feel about that restructuring, anybody on the panel, and how do you, Judge H, think that trial judges would feel about a return to mandatory guidelines? I've been dominating the conversation, so I'm going to defer on this one. I'll come back to it if, at the end of everybody else's response, but I do not want to go first, if you don't mind. I guess I'll begin. I do think that there there is... Um, a benefit to really looking at restructuring the guidelines. I think just remembering, once again, I mean, these guidelines were created in the 1990s at the time where policies were put into place that we know have had disparate, disparate impacts on minority communities. And to think that those guidelines are still in place, uh, when I look at the mandatory, I've only been a judge under the discretionary guidelines not the mandatory guidelines. So in truth, I can't really speak to how it would be like going back to the mandatory guidelines. But I'm also open-minded, and I guess this, this is what I was saying earlier. I think when you bring the data and you take it and you provide it to judges and you have those conversations, I think ultimately every judge wants to do what is right. They want to uh, be imposing sentences that are fair and equitable and uh, they don't want to be the outliers either over or uh, well below. Uh, and I, I think once you do that and provide that information, whether it's a mandatory, whether it's a discretionary sentence, I think ultimately, I, I, I do think we, we need to tighten them up a little bit. I think they're too wide, uh, whether they're discretionary or mandatory or not, because we know that we can go, even when they're mandatory, they're can find substantial compelling to go above, find substantial compelling to go below. I do think tightening them up is what we need to do, but we need to have, we need to really look at the information, share it among our colleagues, talk about it. And I, and I agree, I think we should be sharing what are the sentences and other in separate parts. It was stunning to me to see the differences in counties, because I don't know how my, my neighbor next door to me even sentences. Um, and I think that that would be an important part of having those conversations as we go forward. I don't know if I quite answered your question. Um, I, from where I sit, the, I think Lockridge was a unhelpful decision. Um, the, uh, the substantial and compelling standard was uh, uh, was real in the sense that if, if I thought a sentence was out of line, I could talk to a colleague about it and say, you know, well, where's the substantial and compelling? And, I, you know, I, I don't have that tool any longer. Um, you know, my own view, although it's long since passed, is that Lockridge should have made the min-min um, mandatory. I mean, sorry, uh, uh, not mandatory, because that's the true minimum, and the min-max is a, just something that's set as a matter of policy, and that should be mandatory. Um, I don't know why we have a Sixth Amendment right to a longer sentence. Um, <laughs> So, uh, but Lockridge is the law, so uh, at, least for, at least for now. Uh, Barbara, let me just respond with two thoughts. The first is, if you're going to try to dispense with the uh, discretion that Lockridge necessarily imposes upon the guideline structure, I, I think one of the things you'd have to do is go to what's a, a pure charge offense system, not a real offense system at all, because that's the only way you can get there. If you're using any kind of real offense system, it's never going to work because obviously there are all sorts of factors that bear upon the calculation of the guideline range. Uh, the other point I'd make is that one of your proposals, which is also, I think, kicking around in a proposed court rule from the Michigan Supreme Court right now, and which was 
uh, the practice when I was in the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Eastern District of Michigan was to provide a forecast of what the guideline range would be. And if the computed guideline range under the sentencing investigation report turns out to be higher, you have a right to withdraw your plea if you wish to withdraw your plea. Now, having said that, I want to be careful in my representative capacity for the Michigan Judges Association because I had a lot of judges complaining that there's just no way in the state system you can accurately figure out what the guideline range is likely to be at time of plea. You just can't. Too many cases, not enough access to the resources and probation. Everybody says it's impossible to do. Now, impossible is never a good word to use. And I can tell you that in the federal system under Federal Rule of Criminal Procedure 11C1C, you actually can agree to a sentence. And whether you want to call it Cobbs or Killebrew or whatever you want to call it in the state system, when you're setting the guideline range, that's just kind of a variation on the Federal Rule 11C1C or Cobbs if the judge is involved or Killebrew if the attorneys are involved. So you can get there. It's just going to have to be resourced better, I would say. Because having represented lots and lots of clients in the Western District where they wouldn't tell you what the guideline range was going to be, you would plead and you would do the best you could to forecast the range for your client and you'd say, I think you're looking at six to eight years and then it comes back 30 to life and I can't tell you how often we got to that. And we, you know, we fight it back down and we eventually we get to the right range again. That sort of uncertainty just engenders frustration with the whole system. And so if there's a way to make it work, and I don't know that we can make it work today, but if there's a way to make it work so that people would know at time of plea what their guideline range was going to be, uh, it seems to me that takes both the uncertainty and the unfairness out of the system. And, you know, I alluded to this in my earlier comments, but one thing I noticed when I came back to prosecution after being gone for over 20 years was that propensity to sentence bargain. Um, and it was precisely because of the real or perceived, um, you know, the uncertainty. And we all, of course, try to guess what our various judges are going to do. And like you m indicated, you know, from courtroom A, B, and C, they could be, you know, really quite different. And I find that, of course, in my county as well. And I, I do have our public defenders here who was an assistant prosecutor in the past. I don't know if he wants to. I don't know what the current practice is and how it may have changed. But, um, you know, I, I, that is trying to I I like to have judicial discretion. I like to have prosecutor discretion. So when we sentence bargain, it is taking that discretion away, which I'm not fond of. But it's doing it because um, with some judges, the, at least the perception is, it's a wild card, and we really have no idea. And the range can be so huge that we that the you know defendants not want to plead guilty if you know you might get 12 years more than you thought you were. So that is something that definitely is a real consideration: is how we have ranges, and looking at habitual consecutive sentencing, prior history, and things of those nature that might impact those really huge ranges um, might make it easier for us all to pr properly exercise, hopefully properly exercise our discretion. I think the new court rule says, or, or that it, it's being considered is if it, if it turns out to be different, they can withdraw the plea. I mean, I don't know how often in reality they'll be able to do it, but I think that's the, the notion. Yeah, I, I know I'm going to send a comment in when it says different, because... I, I would think it would be higher, not lower. I mean, if you're going to let people withdraw, I, I, I hate the use of the word different because, I mean, you get a guideline range of half what you thought it was, but at that point you think, hey, roll the dice. Let's see what happens. But yes, yeah, that, that point is very well taken. Oh, um, let me grab Anne and then I'll So I just wanted to follow up on that. Um, there is a proposed court rule amendment and the comment period that I'm looking at my notes here is through March 1st of this year. And maybe this is a good time to urge the um, audience today to consider writing a comment. So the proposal is that it, with a COPS evaluation that the court, that there be a statement of the estimated sentencing guidelines range when a court offers a COPS evaluation. And then if the range turns out to be different, that the defendant has an opportunity of plea withdrawal. But, I, you know, it seems to me you could write in as well and suggest that that be for more than COPS evaluations. 
and you know maybe the Supreme Court hears from enough people, they would consider um, you know some type of uh, amendment that has to do with you know putting a proposed guidelines range on the record at the time of the plea and plea withdrawal if it turns out to be different than expected. Um, I want to know what what are specific sentencing reforms or ways that the guidelines could potentially be restructured that might best help to combat racial disparities? And specifically, um, when we think of things like the PRV, we know that similar to the way risk assessments often have racism by proxy, right? Uh, we know black people in particular are more likely to be over policed. They're more likely to be stopped. They're more likely to be overcharged. Um, and so just blanketly having something like the PRV doesn't account for a lot of those things and can lead to people being, you know, sentenced more harshly under the guidelines. So are there specific ways that you think the guidelines could be restructured? And then um, I am an advocate from the Detroit Justice Center. And so I want to know, um, are there ways that we as community members or advocates should be pushing or um, showing up in these spaces to support the call for the creation of a commission? But let me start with something that I think is probably the best place to start. Uh, many of you probably know that in the last couple of years, the state of Michigan has really broadened the opportunity to set aside convictions. And I think if you want to start trying to fix the problem, one of the best ways to start trying to fix the problem is get a clear indication that PRVs can't be scored on the basis of convictions that have been set aside. Uh, no, they, no, no, what I'm saying is, right, make sure that they cannot. Right, and as a result of that, I, that, that's the first thing that comes to mind because I know that they're now setting up these expungement clinics all over the state. And if somebody's in that sort of circumstance you describe where just growing up in a community would necessarily lead to a higher likelihood of having a criminal record, if you can get that criminal record set aside, and then if you get that criminal record set aside, it doesn't count in your PRV scoring. It seems to me that they, at least it gives the opportunity for everybody to take care of the problem. I mean, obviously people have to avail themselves of it, but I think that the outreach efforts on that have really been tremendous. I think that, uh, one, the 10-year gap that is currently required is too long, and I don't think that a PRV should be equal to offense variables. Uh, you know, always, and sometimes when I, I have a jury trial, I, I may tell the jury that I'm like a JV Christian. I'm not all the way varsity Christian. So I, I've done things, whether it's drunk driving or maybe bootleg movies, and, you know, I, I don't think there's anybody that's ever bought a bootleg movie went 10 years without buying a bootleg movie. So, but, but that's a crime. And I, I know, unfortunately, I've probably driven home uh, 0.08 or above. So just things like that, that when you just take into the, uh, the reality of life and just the 10-year gap is it, just too long. And I just had a case uh, last week. It's a drug case. My guy, client, possessed. 0 0.05 grams of methamphetamine. His offense variables were zero. But his PRVs, uh, I think, were over 60. So his guidelines were five months to 23 months. And he wound up getting uh, 270 days. And when arguing back and forth with the judge, I actually did the math. It was 0 0.00015, a uh, uh, 15 thousandth of a gram per day is what he wound up getting. So the, the offense, the, excuse me, the PRVs can significantly uh, enhance, unfairly in my opinion, a punishment for a, a, a relatively low level offense. And depending on the judge, uh, you know, a judge may, you know, see that as a reason to, to do a downward deviation or a judge, you know, may say, no, you know, the guidelines are what they are. Uh, your client hasn't learned. I'm going to give them 270 days. But, you know, if the uh, in my opinion, the PRVs are creating uh, a guideline system where somebody who doesn't even have enough drugs to get high can get five months in, in jail, then, then that's a problem. I actually have a question for Judge Yates. Uh, because I've, I guess, newer on the bench, I'm curious, and I'm hearing you're speaking 
on behalf of uh, you know MJA and all, all of the judges. Is there a difference in kind of the the way it's viewed based on the amount of years you've spent? people have spent on the bench in terms of how they're looking at the prior record variables, uh, a person's, you know, history, whatever factors are, the discretion, things of that nature? That, that's a good question. I, I think that what happens when judges have spent a lot of time on the bench is they get an ingrained sense of how things are supposed to go. And as a result of that, uh, all of us who've been around on the bench a while fall into patterns. And I think it's really helpful when we have new judges come on the bench and they take a look at it fresh um, for all of us to think harder about that. There's this natural tendency when they staff the judicial education programs to have the most experienced judges always doing the teaching. But if the most experienced judges are always doing the teaching, uh, we're just teaching those ingrained notions that we've thought the same way for a long, long time. Um, I was telling... Judge Gleischer and Judge Shapiro at lunch about when I took over the federal public defender's office. Uh, I had been a federal prosecutor for seven years at that point, and I'd done a lot of work in the Sixth Circuit, and I really knew Sixth Circuit and Supreme Court law inside and out. And the first thing I did when I was given the authority over the office is I spent the next five months of my life trying to convince Paul Denenfeld to come over. And I, for those of you who know Judge Denenfeld, my colleague on the court now, maybe the most brilliant lawyer I've ever, and creative lawyer I've ever known in my life. And so he came over having never done any federal criminal defense work before, and it was fascinating to just see his mind work, trying to see his way around problems. And I, I would often tell him, great idea, but the Sixth Circuit already knocked it down. Great idea, but the Supreme Court knocked it down three years ago. But there's real value in seeing things with a fresh set of eyes, and uh, so I... I, I like your idea so much, I may go back to Don McCarty and say, when we're talking about staffing sentencing uh, instructor panels for MJI sessions, why don't we get an interesting mix there? Why don't we get somebody who's only been sentencing for a year and a judge from the Court of Appeals, and then maybe two people have been doing it a long, long time? I'm sorry, I have one more comment. Uh, we do have now uh, a commission that's working on continuing uh, ed education. Um, and so judges are going to, at some point, we're going to develop a system where there will be continuing education for judges. And so as we're going forward and looking at what you're doing here and these, uh, you know, whether we want to kind of push some of these ideas, uh, that is a ability to maybe reach some of the judges who've been around for quite some time, who maybe are more ingrained uh, in their philosophies and kind of have more of those conversations, cross-generational conversations, yep. because I can't relate to some of what is being said. If somebody pled guilty in front of me and they thought their guidelines were 5 to 23 and turned out they were 24 to 48, I, I would allow them to withdraw. I just And I've, I read that recommendation, and I was, I guess, surprised that... Uh, it, 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 that there was dispute over it. So. <laughs> One thing I'd add, just from the perspective of the appeals court, is there are judges who are regular appearers in our court <laughs> um, for, for huge sentences. And, you know, the, the guidelines largely began in the 80s because there were two or three judges in the state who wanted to give 100 years to a lot of people. Um, and I, I'd be interested, although, of course, now I'm just talking theoretically, I mean, how, how much of, of some of these uh, are really coming out of a handful of, of uh, courtrooms? But we definitely see uh, regular uh, travelers in terms of sentencing way, way uh, over the guidelines. Pardon? There would be more meaningful purport. Could you say it again? Yeah. I talk federally, but um, my experience was um, sentences were almost never sent back for being too long. And, you know, I was in the post Booker world, so, mm -hmm. you know, it wasn't a substantial and compelling type standard. But it, do you think there would be more reviews of extreme sentences and more sort of rigorous appellate review happening, more sentences reversed? for being too long and out of step with the guidelines if we had a different system. Because 
We're not seeing I, much of that right now. I don't know because it's so it's so rare for us to see the prosecutor appeal of a sentence. Um, is that answering your question? I, I I'm not sure I completely got it. Oh, I don't know the answer. My belief is yes, and more than just the number is, I don't even know what proportionality means, frankly. Um, I know what the guidelines are, and I can understand substantial and compelling, but proportional is so subjective. Uh, it's difficult to uh, make an argument that something isn't proportional, particularly, you know, if you have, if you have an articulate and very upset victim, you know, reasonably so, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it, it has, can have an enormous influence, at least that's my belief. I'm not, I'm not a trial judge. Um, and, uh, you know, if you have a dramatic story from a crime victim. It's difficult. I mean, I know if somebody in my family was a crime victim, I'd want somebody to go to prison for a long, long time. But we were, <laughs> that's not our function, right? Our function is to follow the law and, and impose appropriate sentences. Um, and so... Uh, I, I guess I'm just wandering here. I'm not sure what I was saying anymore about it. I apologize. Um, but I do think that there are certain judges who we have no mechanism to address the problem of the handful of judges who are going to give as much as they can give, no matter what. I want to check in. Anne, are you doing okay over there? Yes. I wanted to make my back is to you, which is terribly rude. Sorry. Thank you for checking in. Um, I'll just follow up. Um, you know, I tend to, I forget, because I was an appellate lawyer, I forget that uh, most of the departures are downward. And so when I'm thinking about judges having more discretion, of course, I'm thinking I don't want them to have more discretion to depart upward. Um, but, you know, the idea that discretion could be a good thing, uh, you know, often slips my mind. And so I, I guess I go, come back to the idea that um, either having mitigating circumstances within the guidelines, or I also like the idea that you don't have to score the highest number of points possible and that you could give something that you think is appropriate. That actually might be a good way of um, bringing in more discretion at sentencing that would make it a more consistent and proportional process. Those are my comments. Thank you. Um, anyone else want to jump in before I open it up for more questions? Everyone okay down there? Questions from the audience? Yes, John. I just wanted to see that a number of the recommendations are around the intersection of habitual charging and the guidelines. I just wanted to see whether um, the panel has any reactions to those. Um, you know, in, because the habitual didn't apply under judicial, and we've also had decisions like People versus Gardner that have really expanded the scope of the statute. So one of those. So I can comment just real quickly, um, and I don't claim to be an expert in it, but so, you know, because I practiced um, before the a huge rise in the number of habitual supplementations, um, we had, we used habitual supplementation in the 80s into the early 90s, but we had one prosecutor, we had bright orange folders. It was really viewed as the extraordinary case that you would habitualize. It might be a situation where someone's current charge just really didn't reflect what we thought was how heinous the individual's acts really were, um, because we didn't maybe we're missing an element or something. Or we, um, but when I came back, that was one of the most shocking things to me to see how um, you know basically everything that can be habitualized is often habitualized. Um, certainly, like I said, that was one of the first things I have done to try to change it. Um, it has had in Ingham, uh, it, you know, it's had a couple of effects. One is we have um, far fewer people are sentenced to longer terms of years because of not using habitual supplementation. But an unintended consequence that I did not see and that is troubling is that Part of my goal was to reduce the racial disproportionality. And unfortunately, the racial disproportionality has been maintained, even though we've lowered the number of actual people of all categories going to prison or for long terms, um, we haven't fixed the problem overall. So, um, but I, and I do not speak for all prosecutors who have this for number one goal this year is to keep truth and, truth and sentencing. 
um, as the uh, goal for the Prosecuting Attorneys Association. Um, but habitual in particular and felony firearm as a form of, well, consecutive sentencing are things that I just think need to go by the wayside because they, they're, when you look at all the wonderful work that Safe and Just Michigan has done, um, we just know that those disproportionately impact on some of the most um, over, um, already over incarcerated mo members of our community. So, um, as as from my perspective, I I would be in favor of significantly reducing habitual offending back to more where it was. You know, when you habitualize somebody, it was an option, but it wasn't for sneezing. In my experience, uh, habitual offenders have just been a negotiating tool by prosecutors. Uh, typically, um, if it's, you know, maybe Wayne County, where you, you would always see if there was a habitual charge, it'd be dismissed. you are taking a plea. Some counties, if it's a habitual four, they'll knock it down to a habitual two. Uh, and I don't think it's necessary because, again, with the way PRVs are scored, uh, whether a prosecutor dismisses or keeps a habitual, that is still taken into account in elevating the guidelines. Uh, so it depends on what county you're in. If you're in one of the counties uh, where maybe uh, Livingston County or, or uh, Berrien County, where the habitual offender really means something, Jackson County, where you're really going to get more time, then it's definitely something that you have to, uh, to, to think about. But I don't, I don't think it's necessary. I don't think it really serves any purpose. And I've had a couple occasions where even though the habitual offender notice had been dismissed. Prosecutors have come to court and argued for uh, an upward departure from the guidelines. So I don't think it's necessary. It's just a, a tool that's used to, to induce pleas. Other questions? Yeah, hi, thanks everybody. Um, how much support or resistance do you think there would be um, for the the third recommendation we have on there is just make sort of across the board um, lower the starting points so how much uh, which I think would be a major have a major impact on reducing sentence length so how how much support resistance might there be for just that like just straight up maybe you know this is not rocket science you know just if you want to reduce sentence lengths like lower the starting point you know the judges I've spoken with they say when I'm calculating the guidelines, I use it as a starting point. And so, okay, what if we just sort of across the board reduce the, the starting point on that? How much resistance support would there be for that? I think it's kind of to Aaron's point about race as well. So if you, you know, raising sentence lengths disproportionately affected people of color. So if you reduce those, that will also disproportionately affect people of color as well. Maybe in a positive way in the sense of lowering sentence length. So, but that's like a political, that's a tough political ba uh, battle. I don't think that's low-hanging fruit at all. But, you know, if anybody has perspective on support, resistance, we might face with that. In terms of resistance, I think that the bigger problem there is a legislative problem rather than a judicial problem. At least as far as I can tell, speaking for all of my colleagues across the state, if there are numbers in the A-grid, We'll follow the numbers in the A grid. We're certainly not going to pretend like the numbers should be twice what they are. Uh, there, though, I think you're asking the legislature to do something which they might view as dramatic. I, I frankly don't know. I mean, I spend a lot of time working on legislative initiatives, I ran the legislative committee for years. And it, it's you know, 20 years ago, I would have said that would be a non starter. Today, maybe not so much. Don't know. Um, but that's one of those that really. <laughs> It's more important, I think, to have a good lobbyist than a good strategist. <laughs> I think, oh, I may I just, I'm, I'm but the lowly moderator, but I just wanted to make a point I was thinking about as we were talking. Um, it, what's interesting for me, so I approach this clearly from an academic uh, standpoint, um, and, and I was thinking about two things. Number one is just the divorce of the numbers on the grid from sort of the reality of what they serve, right? So in the most philosophical or theoretical sense, a sentence is the cost we attach to your wrongdoing. And I don't think that if you think about it simply in those terms, in 30 years, we haven't really reassessed whether or not the costs that we have attached are reflective 
of the wrongs as they exist today. I don't know if framed in those terms that that's particularly, you know, radical or revolutionary. But the other thing, too, one of the things that struck me as we were talking is how much of this I heard somebody say at the at the first break, you know, this is really in the weeds. This is like inside baseball stuff for, for people who love policy. But but really, we're talking in the very institutional level and everyone has reflexive sort of defensiveness over their own integrity and their own standards and intellect. And that's true of judges and defense attorneys and prosecutors and legislators. But we're really just talking about institutional changes and 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 when you see that institutional mechanisms produce disparities that doesn't require malice of the actors in those institutions and so i think pitching it that way might help to negate some of the resistance that one might experience but i'm not an expert i'm just a moderator mr johnson i didn't mean to interrupt you would you like to go ahead yeah i just don't think whatever you do to the guidelines it is not going to adjust racial disparity if one exists in sentencing for particular grid. It's not going to happen. Wayne County was a closed, it was like a closed society. It was like a high school in terms of, and not in a bad way, just the familiarity you had with the judges. And when I was significantly practicing in Ingham County, it's the same way as we were talking at lunch. You knew what judges, you knew what judges you suspected thought black people were dangerous. You just knew. One of, one of the uh, most exciting moments in Wayne County uh, was when you got your blind draw, right? That, that determined how you litigate the case. And, you know, we have Judge Kenny back in the back there. You knew if you were going at that time, Judge Kenny. I've only practiced for the, uh, you know, Judge Bosley a few times. Uh, you knew if there were certain judges, you might be okay. There were other judges that you knew it was going to be a fight. And there's nothing you can do. There's nothing the guidelines can do. And you would see it. You would see the judges. They would always associate with people that look like them. You see them all walking in and out of the building with people that look like them. So you knew. And it's it just, I feel kind of disadvantaged because there's no other defense attorneys here uh, to, to back me up on this. I, I see Russ, okay. Oh, yes. I, and I see uh, uh, Marla. Uh, it was Marla, right? Marla, yeah. So you knew. There's nothing that guidelines are going to do is going to change. It's going to take a judicial, I think Thurgood Marshall called, what did, to paraphrase Thurgood Marshall, said revolution is good, but evolution is permanent. It is, it is a judicial evolution that is going to be needed to change racial disparity. It is going to take, and, and you know, I'm not saying this is a good thing, you know, whether somebody is more comfortable with a crime that somebody's committed. That's not necessarily a good thing. But if you have somebody that grew up in an environment where there was very little crime, very little diversity, their only uh, association with diversity was what they saw in the news, they became, and the reality of it is, uh, most judges start off as prosecutors. Very few judges have uh, both a prosecutorial and, and defense background. So they became prosecutors for a reason, because they have a certain belief system. They don't divorce themselves of that belief system when they sit on the bench. And so it's just going to take time, and it's going to take a lot of fighting and limiting that discretion that they have to try and combat those things. But other than that, I just don't think uh, adjusting the guidelines is going gonna, is gonna to get to where you try to get to in terms of racial disparity. And I just want to comment because I'm really focused, I focus a lot on the beginning part of the system. So I focus on what the police bring to me because I don't initiate, we don't have our own investigators, I don't initiate crimes or ch charges, so I wait to see what the police brings me. The data is pretty universal, uh, our data locally and then the data statewide and nationally when we get it that there, the racial disproportionalities um, exist from the very beginning. So if I only get, if I have two similarly situated individuals, but a person who is a person of color is stopped, searched, and char, you know, the case is brought to me, then that means that as it goes through the system, by the time it gets to the sentence, you know, the sentencing phase, the, um, it's, it may have snowballed. You know, in other words, the disproportionalities at the initial arrest or stop uh, contact have now escalated throughout the system. Who's going to get incarcerated in jail pre-trial? 
though we know that those are there's racial disproportionality. I know that's not the subject today, but it's one of my favorite subjects, so I'm going to get the, go there anyway. But it builds through the system, so by the time we get to the sentence, it's incredibly important, but it's already built on everything that gets you to that point. And, and I, I just want to be clear, I'm not, you know, the diversity of the judge doesn't seem to matter. I mean, there, there were stories that you were told uh, from some of the older uh, judges who, uh, and some of these judges that I've known, I've, I've seen, I've talked to them. Uh, there were a lot of, I call them, in, uh, the civil rights era judges uh, who saw crime, uh, particularly, you know, a black on black crime or urban crime, as the greatest betrayal to the community. So it, it's, I'm not, don't, I didn't bring in the, to the race of the judge, but I want to make it clear. I'm not saying that just because a judge is white or black, it means that the racial disparity is going to, going to change. It is something that, is, that I believe, in my experience, depending on the age of the judge and the mentality of the judge is consistent regardless of the, the uh, ethnicity or nationality of the judge. I, I'd also like to say, I think what this brings out is it's important to look at this from a holistic uh, approach. And so I, I think and part of, one of the first things I had said, and I think everything agrees, you have to have the Criminal Justice Policy Commission, and I think that's your first policy priority. And then you can look at all these individual things, but then you're going to miss some of those bigger things. So at the Third Circuit Court, uh, we have our Diversity and Inclusion Committee, and thankfully that's under, uh, we have such great leadership that supports that. And we've come up with a plan, but in that conversation, I think, and what I've learned through years of being on that is we really Part of some of what's happening with these sentencings are looking at our own implicit biases, our, uh, how we are viewing people, seeing people. And I agree with Mr. Johnson. It doesn't, I've uh, spoken with judges who've taken, uh, you know, black judges who've taken uh, the test about implicit bias and found that they had a bias against people from their own community. And I think that it's because of things that we're not, conscious of or you know we don't understand and I think part of all of this is having these longer greater conversations uh, and how can we uh, when we are sentencing people not be sentencing them with our biases in mind and what studies have shown is if you're aware of your biases you're less likely to sentence according to those biases uh, and that's part of this whole conversation. And so I, I'm afraid of kind of going piecemeal with some of these uh, reforms that are recommended because then other things are going to slip in uh, by, the, uh, by the wayside. I think that talking to people with the piecemeal stuff so they're comfortable with it, like it's going to give judges more judicial discretion and, you know, maybe not having to assign these. I think that's great as, as talking points, but if you go in with just that, then you might be losing kind of the big picture of what you're trying to achieve. So we have about 10 minutes left of our session. So I thought we would start at the end and do, when I teach, I call these Jerry Springer final thoughts, but that doesn't seem fitting of our occasion. So we'll just call them our wrap up final thoughts. Um, it could be anything, uh, maybe something that another panelist has offered that you'd like to touch on or um, a charge to leave the audience with, um, but everyone will have a, a chance to share sort of their concluding thoughts. How can you ever ask a lawyer to you know, not talk, <laughs> right? Um, so just the, um, the, first of all, gr groups and meetings like this are really important. This report is fabulous. The work that is done um, Every time there's something that we can really point to where someone has thoughtfully looked at a great deal of data, um, even though a lot of people won't look at it, we, you know, those of us who will, it can really change um, how we approach it. And um, so I, I guess I liked Mr. Johnson's comment about the evolution. I, I think of that. The Beatles also said something like that. Um, and that, you know, sometimes the changes are um, being worked on for many, many years, and then they seem to happen overnight. We, uh, it's very easy sometimes to, to give up. Um, I plunge into despair with regularity. In fact, when Barb originally asked me to be on this panel, I said no because I was in a place of deep despair. Um, and I thought, well, I can't add anything because, you know, everything's just so shitty right now. Um, but it's not. 
every day there's something good. And that's, I guess my charge is that, you know, to, to focus on that next thing where we can make a, cha- a difference for an individual or a piece of legislation or something that happens. And we can. And, and so that's my not in despair comment today. I think regardless of whether or not there's legislative change, uh, this is important. I mean, you know, our sentencing in Jackson County is our, our Wednesday and Thursday. And I'm going to start incorporating things in this book this week. Uh, I don't need, you know, it'd be nice if, if the, uh, you know, judges as a whole made decisions. But every judge I know, every judge I've ever practiced in front of uh, is an intellectual. They like to think and they like to think on, on you know, intellectually and like to make logic-based decisions or what they believe to be logic-based decisions. And if I can incorporate uh, statistical things uh, that, are, that are in this book into real-world practice and lower, you know, uh, a sentence a year or two, then that's a win regardless of what the legislature does with it. So just having these conversations and, and producing this data uh, is important and will make a difference. I. Hey. I agree with all the comments that have been made. I do think that most everyone wants to do the right thing, and it's just about giving people that information, having these conversations, and I do think we can get to the point of doing the right thing. We might not all agree on exactly what the right thing is, but I I think that we are in a special time right now uh, where it is the time to really, we can get some traction on some of the things that we want to go forward with and make changes uh, too, so. Most of the criminal justice reform that's been accomplished in the last couple of years, and there's been an extraordinary amount, uh, has really been a function of collaboration and good strategy. And if you're going to do this, I would encourage you to follow that path of collaboration and good strategy. I was interested to hear, for example, that the Prosecuting Attorneys Association of Michigan has as their main priority no erosion of truth in sentencing. Well, if that's going to be a barrier, you need to know that going in. If you're working with the legislature, um, you've got to understand that the members of the legislature have to have extraordinary bandwidth, and this is just one thing across a really broad spectrum of considerations they have. Uh, the education process may be substantial, but I, I would tell you that I've found that we've had really good experiences dealing with Chairman Gramfiller and Uh, David LeGrand in the House Judiciary Committee. They get the stuff. They know how it works. Um, They really will understand what you're trying to do. And if you want to do something by rule amendments, that's a whole different process because then you've got a fairly sophisticated audience at the State Court Administrative Office and, of course, on the Supreme Court. And then, as I say, buy-in from groups is going to be key. And I'm I'm always happy to talk with anybody. We have a terrific legislative team, too, at Michigan Judges Association. And uh, I I know that CDM can be helpful as well. So uh, all I'd ask is that before this effort's launched, that you think about that which is possible versus that which is going to be trying to scale a mountain and think about how you want to approach it, because I, I think that it's Despite the fact that there's been so much change in the last couple of years, I think you still have a relatively receptive audience if you can make the kind of persuasive presentation that's been made today. Vivienta. Uh, so I would say that um, obviously a sentencing commission can do a lot of good and there's so, in so many different areas, um, although I think it will take time. Um, In the meantime, I think perhaps given that it's the judges who are exercising discretion, then maybe we do look at that and, you know, we look at um, giving them information about what their colleagues are doing, which I think is a great idea. And then also thinking about what's called decision hygiene, um, again, from this book about noise. And it's talking about how the judge reaches the decision and maybe just educating judges there that there are some judges who, you know, just quickly reach a very intuitive judgment about what the sentence should be. And they don't necessarily listen to all of, you know, the presentations. Um, But the better approach, they say, in terms of eliminating unwanted variations 
is to delay that intuitive judgment as long as possible and to try to actively seek as much objective you know, information as you can from all sources. And so maybe if we're talking to judges about how they form their decisions and then also you know, what their colleagues are doing, maybe that's something we can start with. I didn't really have anything to add, uh, except I, I think the one thing we didn't talk much about that um, uh, that I think would be helpful, because I'm continuing to think about Lockridge, is the base sentence for the offense, and then everything, all the fact-finding occurs only in the context of, of, of a, a departure, um, uh, because the... Um, the fact-finding in the guideline scoring is very difficult to, I'm looking at the appellate level, it's very difficult to say a judge made a, a you know, an error in, in uh, scoring a particular guideline when there's evidence that goes both ways. Um, whereas I think uh, in order, in review of a departure sentence, uh, we have more um, authority to examine the, the grounds for that departure than we do for the grounds for scoring for example, an OB7, which is really a devastating score, and is now it's not that hard to get scored for OB7 in some courts. Um, uh, but there's not that much we can do about it. Okay. Well, thank you to all of our panelists and to Safe and Just Michigan and to all of you. You've been very attentive. Thanks. Well, thank you to a very thoughtful and interesting panel. Um, it was it, it was very good to hear uh, what seemed like a consensus among uh, different practitioners and judges for a permanent criminal justice policy commission for reform on habitual offenders, for collecting and properly distributing data, and for more accurate and uh, predictable guidelines that match, uh, that match the offense. So thank you for, uh, for, for an outstanding panel. We are going to finish with uh, Safe and Just Michigan Director John Cooper talking about what's next, developing a strategy for going forward. Mr. Cooper is the executive director of Safe and Just Michigan. His advocacy is focused on Michigan's adult criminal legal system, with an emphasis on strategies to reduce Michigan's prison and jail populations, remove barriers to successful reentry, and shift resources into programs and services that promote public safety and health. Mr. Cooper has led several successful legislative campaigns to reform Michigan's criminal legal system, including the campaign to, to enact objective parole and Michigan clean, the Michigan Clean Slate campaign. He served as a criminal justice policy advisor to State Representative David Legrand, and he spent several years as a litigator in a Washington, D.C. law firm. Mr. Cooper. Hey, everybody. Um, thank you for coming today and um, for being so active in participating. Um, you know, I, I really um, learned a lot from listening, and um, I appreciate all the presenters. And I um, want to give a special thanks to the report authors who um, really have done this amazing work um, with very little um, support from me. <laughs> um, so thank you for that. I, I also want to thank uh, the SJM team who planned the event, uh, Veronica in particular, uh, and Kate, and uh, Valerie at Conference Direct. Um, so I'm here to wrap things up. I'm not going to talk at you for half an hour. I, I really, um, as the, the title of this, What's Next, suggests, I want to uh, engage you guys on a few issues. Um, we are hoping to reestablish a sentencing commission in Michigan. I say reestablished because there was one. First, when the guidelines were created, um, it was defunded and disbanded shortly thereafter. And then there was a sort of a successor created for a few years from 2014 to 2019 called the Criminal Justice Policy Commission that um, unfortunately had a legislative sunset that was not renewed um, for, for reasons that I do not think were related to its utility. Um, so I think... A few things, you know, obviously the report raises a host of issues and um, one might ask, you know, why start with the sentencing commission? You know, we, we could pursue habitual offender sentencing reform, 
There's lots to do on OVs, PRVs, and the like. Um, so I, I think for, from our perspective, um, it comes down to kind of some of the forest and trees issues that Judge Bazzi uh, mentioned. You know, first, I think any individual issue around sentencing reform is going to be a heavy lift in this legislature. And that's the function of the political environment, um, a lack of expertise on these issues within the legislature. We have a very, very strictly term limited legislature. A third of the House turns over every two years. And that makes it very hard to do projects that are longer than two years within the legislature. So having a, a permanent body with institutional knowledge, expertise, uh, data, would, would be really helpful in, in taking you know, a holistic look at guidelines as well as many of these individual issues. Um, you know, we also think that having a commission is really an urgent need within the system. I mean, is, is there systems we spend billions of dollars on annually? And um, you know, as the report documents, a substantial part of these costs are a product of the policy choices that were made in the sentencing guidelines. And this is a system where people are getting sentenced every day you know, hundreds and thousands of people, is a, two, a quarter of a million criminal cases come through our courts every year. And, um, you know, continuing to sentence people every day um, without any sort of meaningful oversight, I, I think is a problem that we should all be concerned about. Um, in addition, more studies needed on a number of the questions raised. Uh, folks were quick to point out that some of the data is a little old, which we acknowledge. Um, but uh, uh, in addition, you know, we think having a commission in place will make discussion of other reforms better informed and more data-driven. Um, and I, I think, finally, the uh, commission would provide a forum to do research and debate policy change and an expert body with broad representation to make recommendations. So that's why I think you know, we are leading with the commission as opposed to some of these other issues I, um, you know, reasonable people can disagree about what to prioritize, but from my perspective, I think the commission is actually really important. I also think, just politically, it's the kind of thing that could could pass with relative ease in the legislature compared to some of the other things that we're talking about. Um, I don't think there's much disagreement in the room that we should have a commission. I, if, is there anyone that thinks we shouldn't have a commission? Okay, so I'm going to skip over that part. Um, then I think, you know, the most salient sort of set of next questions are around composition. You know, who should be part of this commission? Mandate and functions. Um, what should the commission be um, asked to do? And um, I don't know if you guys have discovered this, but I, I have included some um, legislation in your, your packet. And this is actually the enabling legislation for the Criminal Justice Policy Commission. And it's, it's less than four pages, I think it's three pages total. And I, I think it's a really nice, just um, short look at the possibilities of what a commission can look like. And this one sort of you know, lays out what constituencies get to make recommendations for appointment. It sort of has the core functions. Um, I understand the, the mandate for this is just a little bit broader than the original sentencing commission. This has more sort of uh, broad research powers. But you know, from my perspective, this is a pretty good model. And I think Professor Mitchell, I don't know if you've had the chance to look at it, but this I think is in line with what you'd recommend as well um, in terms of a uh, representative body that includes you know, most of the relevant stakeholders has a relatively broad mandate around you know, system issues, not just the, the sentencing guidelines. Um, so I think I'm interested in uh, thoughts from the group on what is most important to have in a commission. Um, and that's, that's a broad, open-ended question, but you know, just to give you sort of um, why I'm asking is we're, we're looking to convene a work group and start to put together proposed legislation related to this. So the more input that we get from you all, the more I can sort of work with um, uh, draft legislation. Um, because I, I think, you know, if we can get consensus among stakeholders behind a particular proposal, 
I don't see there being a ton of resistance in the legislature, but um, that can get muddied up very quickly if not. So any, any thoughts in terms of uh, Sophie? Yeah, we were talking about this earlier when we saw the commission make up from other states, and it, it seemed really top-heavy with joy, judges and lawyers and law enforcement, which I think is important. But I also think there needs to be a lot of community members and or directly impacted community members, as well as formerly incarcerated people that actually have life experience. Thank you. Um, yes, Jonathan. When, when these things are put together in Lansing, there is sort of a usual suspects sort of list of folks that um, are put on, and sometimes it can lead to gridlock um, or unproductive conversations. Um, so I, I see um, Professor Burgess Proctor and Grady um, talking. One question I had was about the number of staff, because Gr Grady, were you the only staff member? Yeah, that's... That seems hard. <laughs> so, so I think what, one reaction I had to the policy commission was that probably it could use a bit more staffing in general because when you're talking about something as vast as the criminal justice system, being able to just fulfill the basic functions of a commission is going to take more than one person. Um, Right. Judge Bosi. That, thank you. Uh, if you're going to get people from the same groups, then they're representing maybe a different segment of, 
of that particular group so that the full kind of voice can be heard. Yeah, I mean, it's it's tricky, especially with, with roles like prosecutors, where you do have a broad range of views. Um, D.J. Hilson, the Muskegon County prosecutor, was the representative on the Criminal Justice Policy Commission. And, and he's, he's known as somebody who's relatively good at kind of representing, in a balanced way, the, the group's views. Um, we had, it was four legislators on the Policy Commission, right, Barb? Two from each chamber, one from each party? Yeah, and... You, okay, yeah, I mean, and... You know, that was pretty strong representation, but even with that level of representation, it was hard to get the legislature's attention. You know, I, I think um, uh, Senator Lucido and Santana maybe had a little bit more success just with the Senate being a smaller body and the, those guys being stronger um, personalities. Um, but, you know, it's with a project like looking at the sentencing guidelines or looking at habitual sentencing, you know, that, that's going to require a lot of legislative buy-in and having really strong um, representatives on a commission, I think, is very important to that being taken seriously in the legislature. Um, uh, Judge Kenny. Yes, uh, thank you. And with regards to uh, the discussion this morning, which focused on the capital offenses and, and guidelines, um, I know I'm sort of uh, speaking from a parochial standpoint, perhaps, in that uh, I'm the chief judge at the Third Circuit Court. But um, according to the scale reports, 40% um, of the capital cases that get resolved in the state of Michigan come out of Wayne County. And that also, certainly the discussion that we've had today about the issue of racial disparity with regards to the the way that the guidelines are imposed. I think there's a compelling argument to be made that the Third Circuit Court, Wayne County, and I mean, and the community as well, needs to be represented on the commission. That 40% that number is, that, that's right. I mean, I think it, it's been that way for a while too. Yeah. Um, other comments? Um, so I think that's probably enough. <laughs> it's been a long day. Uh, I know uh, everyone's quite busy. So I want to thank you all for coming. And uh, I want to thank um, the report authors once again for their hard work on all this. And um, please let me know if you'd like to be involved in a work group um, towards legislation. Um, we still don't know what that will look like, but it's something we're going to start working on here. And, um, you know, thoughts on the other recommendations. I, I know there is likely to be legislation on some of these other issues. Um, feel free to email me. I'm John, J-O-H-N, at safeandjustmi.org. And, uh, um, you know, we're, we're looking forward to, um, to moving this forward with, with all of you. So thanks a lot.